welcome to Magical Mystery Talk, episode 9. Number 9, you might say. Will that sound like Turn Me On Dead Man, if I reverse it? Number 9. And the one. This is Mark Devlin, and just to advise up front, I'm going to be taking a bit of a back seat on this episode. Reason being, firstly, I've got an absolutely colossal workload on at the moment, which is not unusual for me. And secondly, Matt and Desiree have a whole load to talk about this episode. They are, after all, the experts on all things Beatles, conspiratorial and esoteric, and I generally just act as the host. So I'm going to hand over the reins to Matt to discuss all these fascinating matters that they have on the agenda for this time, which include the new book by David Whelan, uh, re-examining the assassination of John Lennon, a new book about Epstein's lawyer, David Jacobs, not the radio DJ, but a different one. Matt's done an interview with the author of that book. A CBE for Stella McCartney. Uh, she's also a part of the COP28 Global Climate Warming Change Conference. Why wouldn't she be? There's a new Mel Evans book, lots of books out, discussing his role within the Beatles camp. Of course, the release of Now and Then, the final Beatles record or is it? Uh, May Pang's new documentary, that's just been released. Bill Gates' daughter allegedly dating Paul McCartney's grandson. Wow, how much more establishment connected can one family be? And Yoko apparently leaving the Dakota, where the assassination of John Lennon happened, of course, after 50 years. So there's a lot there. The best thing I can do is just kick back and listen to Matt and Desiree discuss it and absorb it the same as everyone else out there. So over to Matt and enjoy the show. I'll catch you next time around. So, yeah, thanks, Mark. I'm Matt Sergio, co-host of Magical Mystery Talk and proprietor of the site The Occult Beatles. And hello to Desiree Hall, my co-host and the proprietor of The Number Nine blog, a site about the Beatles from a occult conspiratorial angle of course uh yeah and as mark says this is episode number nine 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 ladies and gentlemen the Beatles. Billy, 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 Billy. Nine seems to be my number, and it's the highest number in the universe. After that, you go back to one. So, yeah, here we go again. It's been a while. <laughs> it has been a little while, hasn't it? I think the last one we did was January 2023, I think, was the last one. Oh, wow. Okay, so number nine. It is, as you know, a really important number uh, when it comes to the Beatles and especially John Lennon. Um Absolutely. I've got a list here of all the number nines that that we can link to, you know, John Lennon and the Beatles. Um, yeah, you go ahead and I'm pulling up stuff as you're talking and I can kind of okay. um, jump in with some extra things and whatnot. Yeah, I've, as I say, I've got a list here and I, I don't remember why I wrote this out. This is from about two or three years ago. It could be that we recorded it on a previous episode. 
of Magical Mystery Talk. I don't remember. I, I seem to recall doing this on some podcast. It could have been for the John Lennon special that I recorded yeah, with Mark some time back to Mark, what would have been John Lennon's 80th birthday. So this would have been back in 2020. But anyway, apparently um, the first person that started to look into this number nine and noticed that there was all these links was Ray Coleman the author of uh, a John Lennon biography um, mm -hmm. back in the early 80s, I think it was. I think he was the first person that noticed this um, and wrote about it in his book. Um, and since then, it's just took off and everybody's been adding bits to it. So what I've got here, okay, so John Lennon was born on October 9th. Oh, nice. um, he was born at 6.30 p.m., so that's 6 plus 3 is nine. Mm -hmm. um, his mother's address at the time he was born was no, uh, number nine Newcastle Road. And mm -hmm. Newcastle also has nine letters. His mother was run over by a car driven by a drunken driver. The car's registration was LKF 630. So that's six plus three, nine. Um, the drunk driver was an off-duty policeman. His badge number was 126. Uh, 1 mm. plus 2 plus 6 is 9. Brian Epstein, Beatles manager, first introduced himself to the Beatles at the Cavern in 1961 on November 9th. Mm -hmm. And the Beatles officially split up nine years later in 1970. Um they actually split up in 1969, kind of. That's when John Lennon said to the rest of the Beatles, that's it, I'm out of here. But they actually carried on recording together and the announcement wasn't made till 1970. But yeah, anyway, um, Epstein died in 1967 on August 27th. So that's two plus seven is nine. Mm -hmm. um, the Beatles received their record contract from EMI in 1962 on May 9th. And... They produced many of their hits at uh, EMI's studios at Abbey Road. Abbey Road, if you add all those letters together, that's nine letters. Mm. The Beatles made their first appearance uh, in America, the all-important America, which was vital if they wanted to take over the world. Their first yeah. appearance in America was on February 9th, 1964, and, and that was mm -hmm. on the Ed Sullivan TV show. When John first met his future wife, his first wife, Cynthia. She was living at 18 Trinity Road. So that's one plus eight mm. is nine. Um, their son, Julian, was born at a hospital in Liverpool with the address 126 Smithdown Road. So that's one plus two plus six is nine. Smithdown is nine letters. Mm. And of course... There's the song Number Nine Dream by John Lennon. And and John knew about the whole number nine thing. He was aware of this and he talked about it in one or two or maybe even more interviews. But I'm aware of at least one or two that he, he talked about the the nine thing, how, how it seemed to be attached to him. So, yeah, he wrote a song and released a song called Number Nine Dream, a solo song. Uh, and that got to number nine in the US charts. Um and there were also Beatles songs with the number nine in them. There was one after 909. There was Revolution number nine, of course, number nine, number nine from where that comes from. And then there's his name. He changed his name from John Winston Lennon to John Ono Lennon. And mm -hmm. yeah, so nine. yeah. Nine um, O's. Nine O's, yeah. And he was shot on December 8th. But in Britain, with the time difference, it was December 9th. Mm -hmm. and, also, and he was shot at in front of the Dakota, which was on West 72nd Street, which is also a nine. And their apartment number was 72, also a nine. <laughs> and... When he was, <laughs> and, it, and it keeps going, when, when he was <laughs> in the solo years, post-split albums, he recorded a total, or he released a total of eight albums. But at the time he died, he was working on a new album, which was yet to be released, and it was released posthumously. So that makes nine albums that he actually worked on while he's 
he was alive. Um, mm. So even though one of them was released after he died, and that that was the Milk and Honey album that came out. Um, and he was uh, born in Liverpool, which is, um, is that nine letters? L-I-V-E-R-P-O-L. Yep. Yeah, nine letters. <laughs> and he was pronounced dead at the Roosevelt Hospital, which Roosevelt is nine letters as well. Um, right. There's actually more, but the, these are the ones that I thought would be the most striking. I, I went for the, the really striking landmark ones um but as i say there's there's so many more but anyway have you got any any more i mean that well loads there. the number nine and uh, the association with the beatles was my um you know re my in inspiration for n naming my blog the number nine blog just because there are so many nines involved with the beatles and in, in particular john lennon um i think you did hit all of the the major ones um the only thing i have is um the when he wrote the song the beatles wrote the song one after 909 they uh wrote that at nine newcastle road in raven tree liverpool and all of those have nine letters so newcastle waver tree <laughs> liverpool all have nine letters and they wrote one after 909 there so but that's i yeah. think you covered all the good ones and absolutely that do you remember when that um, there was, I don't know if they released it in America. I think they did. It was in 2009, the Beatles or what was left of the Beatles by that point, they re-released all their albums, all the studio albums. Right. Um, they, they remixed them, remastered. Mm -hmm. remastered them for the digital market. They put them all out right. on CD again and they released it on the ninth of the ninth month, 2009. And I remember yep. the, the promo for it the the advertising i don't know if it was a poster or whether i saw it online like an online advert but i, I seem to remember that it was abbey road studios it was a picture of abbey road uh, road studios and these big numbers with the date on it and it was 09.09.09 .09 .09. um yeah. mm -hmm. so they know about this thing you know john definitely knew about it because he talked about it and he wrote a song about it released right. number nine dream but since he's passed away it's it's carried on the beatles camp have carried it on they've continued it um yeah absolutely um, absolutely <clears throat> and if you look at that 999 i suppose that that advert if you flip it over then you've got 666 but that takes oh. us off into yeah <laughs> <laughs> that takes us off into another completely different thing i suppose um <laughs> Okay, well, there's there's so much to talk about. Um, it's it's really you know when up until November, October, November, twenty twenty three, there wasn't that much going on in in the sort of the Beatles world, as it were. Um, right. That that there was a there was a couple of events that took place that I'd like to touch on and talk about, um, but there wasn't that much going on. And then suddenly in October, November, it's like bang all these yeah. things started happening new books coming out announcements being made um right. and probably the biggest of them all well not probably definitely the biggest event of all of it and for the whole year is the release of this so-called last Beatles song ever I'll right. believe that when I see it and that's the um now and then song which was assisted with AI of course um and it's been a long road to get to this um, stage with this song. For anyone who has been living under a rock in the last couple of months, basically now and then is a uh, it's been billed as the last ever Beatles song. Um, and basically, what it is, it's that what they've done is um, back in the nineties, uh, George, Paul, and Ringo uh, worked, provided backing. Uh, backing instrumentation uh, to uh, a John Lennon demo, and it, which John had recorded on a piano at uh, the the Dakota um, back in the sort of the late seventies. Uh, George, Paul, and Ringo were recording some instrumentation for this this over this demo tape back in the nineties, but then they just left it. Um, right, it wasn't but, good enough quality or something, right? Yeah, was... yeah, yeah. Uh, but in more recent times, in, in 2023, Paul went back to it with Ringo 
uh, and and they worked on it again, and that and that's uh, and that became a, a single, um, which was released in November. But yeah, it was originally a demo um, back in the seventies. I think depending what version of events you believe, it was either recorded by John in nineteen seventy seven or nineteen seventy eight or seventy nine sometime around then and basically it's just john playing on a piano um with um in in his in his apartment the tv is on in the background he's got a boom box what they call a boom box or a ghetto blaster on top of the piano and he's just going through this song and and there's you know it's it's just a demo he, he never intended for it to be released in the form that he was recording it it's just him playing around playing as it's coming to him because because there's like missing parts of it while he's while he's playing it you know there's parts of it where he mumbles some of the lyrics because he hasn't quite got to the point where he's got all the lyrics worked out um so yeah and then fast forward to 1994 i think it was so the story goes yoko ono saw paul mccartney at an award ceremony i think it was and she handed him a cassette and she said to him here paul see what you can do with these and it was it was a demo cassette, like a compilation of various demos that John had been working on at around the same time in the sort of late 70s. Um, and it was Now and Then was on there. Uh, also, Free as a Bird, Real Love. And I think Grow Old With Me was on there as well. And Grow Old With Me had actually come out before. It had come out on the Milk and Honey album um, as the dem actually at, in its demo form, just John on a piano, quite rough sounding, but um, and so, and I think Real Love had actually come out in demo form as well. I think it was on a John Lennon compilation album, which came out at the end of the eighties as part of a soundtrack for a John Lennon documentary. Um, right. But um, yeah, so basically, what Paul did, he took it into the studio. This demo with this this cassette with all these demo songs on it and he and george and ringo added instrumentation to free as a bird and real love uh, and in the case of free as a bird they also added some extra um verses to it some some extra lead vocals to it um and some backing vocals of course and ringo played drums they played guitars and and all of that and um yeah so basically it's just john's voice with george Ringo and Paul playing over the top of it and uh and they were um Free as a Bird and Real Love were released as singles um in the 90s in 1995 and 96 and then when it got to now and then as I said earlier they began to work on it so I think George put some laid down some guitars for it some lead guitar or some acoustic I think um Paul added some instrumentation as well and Ringo added some drums and then they kind of just left it it got put to one side and that was that um they just moved on with their lives and, and left it um and yeah so fast forward to 2021 and we get the release of the uh the get back documentary series which was um produced and directed by Peter Jackson so Peter Jackson has said when he was putting together this documentary which is basically a fly on the wall documentary it originally came out in 1970 it was released in 1970 as a 90 minute cinema film i think it was basically it's it's a it was a fly on the wall documentary of the beatles in the studio during january 1969 recording uh then new songs for uh a, a new album of course so this was a real fly on the wall documentary as i say and yeah, tens and tens and tens and tens of hours of, of footage was filmed and, and recorded, uh, audio as well. Um, but out of all of that, only about 90 minutes of it was released originally in 1970 when it came out in the cinemas, mm. when it came out in movie theatres. But when Peter Jackson got his hands on um, on that footage in 2020, I think it was, 2019, 2020, and which was finally released in 2021, he managed to release over three episodes on the Disney Plus channel in 2021 about it was I think it was a three episode miniseries. And there was a, over just over two hours per episode um, that he managed to get out into the public. 
Um, but even then, there's still tens and tens and tens of hours of footage which we still haven't seen or heard. Now, he says whilst he was record, well, whilst he was looking at all this footage and listening to it, there were certain parts in the documentary where, where say, for example, George, say, for example, that the Beatles were in the studio and they, and they were rehearsing a song and they would stop and maybe have a cup of tea, have a cigarette. Um, just chill out a little bit. They're, they're still sitting in the studio, but they're just having a little bit of an informal chat and a cup of tea in between songs, in between takes. And the way that Peter Jackson has said it in interviews and stuff, uh, and I'm I'm kind of paraphrasing here. Basically, what he said is, say for example, they they stopped in the middle of a song and they're having a bit of a chat and a cup of tea. Um, say say for example, George is having a conversation. Peter was looking at this footage and 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 looking at George say for example having a conversation with one or more members of the band in between a song and it looked as though what George was saying was really interesting but he couldn't quite pick up what George was saying because whilst he was talking he'd be picking at his guitar he'd be plucking away at the electric guitar and the and the electric guitar was louder than what he was actually saying actually right. what george <laughs> was saying to maybe john or paul or whoever he was talking to and at the same time in the background you might have had ringo tapping away at the drums slightly or somebody else in the background is plonking away at a piano or is making some you know banging noises or moving some equipment or something, or maybe there's another conversation going on. So you couldn't actually hear what George was saying. And this was really annoying Peter Jackson. And I don't know how it happened, but at around this time that Peter Jackson was observing this through the ed- during the editing phases of putting this documentary together, he came up with this new invention. He and some people he worked with came up with this new AI software uh, and which they nicknamed Mal. And <laughs> and the and the reason they nicknamed it Mal was partly uh, in tribute to Mal Evans, who was of course the Beatles' trusted one of the members of the Beatles' trusted inner circle. He was uh, their roadie. He met them and started becoming their roadie when they were still in their pre-fame years at the Cavern in Liverpool, and he stayed with them through the touring years when they were famous um, as their roadie. Then and then when they stopped touring in 1966, he became kind of like. I I don't know. I'm going to say gopher, but that's a little bit, not quite. I mean, a bit slightly disrespectful because he was more than that. But he was the kind of, I mean, he was the kind of guy that um, if if the Beatles were in the studio at two two or three o'clock in the morning and they wanted drugs, (laughs) he would go out and find drugs for them. Or say, for example, Ringo broke a drumstick at three o'clock in the morning. Mal would be able to leave EMI Studios at Abbey Road at three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning and come back within half an hour with drumsticks. And right. God, God knows where he would have found them from, but he had this talent for doing that kind of thing. But yeah, I mean, he was more than that. I mean, he produced um, songs by artists on the Apple label, the Beatles Apple label as well. He wrote songs for bands as well. I think he wrote a song on one of Ringo's solo albums. I think he co-wrote a song with George Harrison on the mm-hmm. Ringo album from 1973. So he was more than just a gopher. But anyway, yeah. So, so yeah, Peter Jackson, uh, this this AI software, uh, he nicknamed it MAL. And what it stands for is machine audio learning. And basically, and I'm, I think I'm right about this, basically what this AI technology does. And I think it is important to mention this because this is actually the, the technology they used on now and then, uh, this so-called AI song. Um, which was released in November of 2023. Basically what this, I've heard him talk about it. And I think if I'm not getting it wrong, if I'm not getting it wrong, I think what he said was, what Peter Jackson said was, what this audio, what this AI software does is you feed it sound and it recognizes the sound. So it's almost <laughs> human-like. It'll If you feed it a guitar, if you feed the sound of a guitar into it, it knows at that point that that is a guitar. Anyway, so to get around this problem of trying to get, as I said before, you know, there was Peter Jackson trying to, for, let's say, for example, he's got George in a conversation in the studio in 1969, but he can't hear him because there's all this instrumentation going on. What this Mal can do, this Mal software can do, it can identify 
every single sound that's going on in the studio whilst George is talking. So it identifies George talking. It identifies the guitar that he's plucking, which is so loud that you can't hear George's voice. It, it identifies all the background noise that's going on. Maybe, you know, Ringo, say, for example, as I say, maybe tapping away at the drums, the plonking of the piano, the background noise, people moving stuff, having chats in the background. This mouse software identifies every single piece of sound. And then what it does is it takes each sound and places it in a... a um, like isolates it? Isolates it all. Yeah, exactly. It <laughs> isolates it all. And then at that point, you can turn the volume up on George's voice um, and maybe turn the volume down on the guitar he's plucking away at or whatever. But mm -hmm. you can turn George's voice up and then put it all back together again. And yeah, and then you can hear George's voice. So this is what this Mal software can do. Um, and they used it again in um, 2022 when the Beatles released or re-released the Revolver album, their 1966 album Revolver. When they re-released that in um, 2022 in box set form, there was a remix version of it. And what Giles Martin did, Giles Martin being, of course, the son of uh, Beatles producer George Martin, Giles Martin mm -hmm. is basically carried on the mantle and is working on Beatles projects now. He used that Mal software um, to take each song from the Revolver album and he did exactly what Peter Jackson did in that film. Um, as you say, he isolated everything. He took every song and isolated every piece of instrumentation and vocal and everything that was on each song, isolated it all. And then he started to, for example, on the song Taxman on the Revolver album, the new mal remix version if you listen to the song tax man if if you're familiar with that song the first thing you'll notice is oh my god the bass you can hear you can hear paul's bass i mean really clearly not only louder but clearly um and that's what he's been able to do thanks to this mal software of course these days you can have as have as if i'm not mistaken I'm not an expert in this kind of thing, but these days you can have as many tracks as you want to. The sky is the limit. So if you want to record um, your vocals, you can have that on one track. You can have um, three part harmonies. You can have one part of the harmony on one track, the second on another, the third on another. If you want piano, you can have that on a separate track. You can have drums on a separate track and on and on you go. You can have as many instruments as you want and they all have different faders different tracks um different channels they don't have to share you know with other sounds but back in the 60s with the revolver album they only had four tracks so back in those days if they had more than four pieces of instrumentation or sound that they wanted to record if there was more than four ingredients in a song that meant that meant they had to share one track and put two or three different ingredients on that one track and the problem with that is back in the day with revolver they only had four tracks so if you put a lead vocal and drums on the same track coming uh, being recorded through one fader that meant they were glued together those two sounds were glued together and there was no way up until this mal software came out that you could unglue the drums from the vocals right. so they were stuck forever but what this mal can do is it can pick up those two sounds on that one track and separate them. So that's how this technology works. This is how this mal technology works. And, and yeah, in 2023, so they use this for the Revolver album. And uh, yeah, in 2023, um, when it came to um, Now and Then, that's what they did with Now and Then. Um, because apparently, and I, you can actually hear now and then, it did actually come out um, as a demo, in demo form, on bootleg albums um, in the 90s. Right. <laughs> uh, the actual original demo. Um, and as I say, as I said earlier, when John recorded that demo, um, he did it in, in, a, in his apartment. He had a boom box on top. And, and, I mean, he, he had a boom really box great. on top. It was, it was really really basic you know as i say he wasn't intending to release that demo as a as a you know he wasn't intending to when he was recording it on that day back in the 70s he wasn't intending for that to come out in public 
Um, and this wasn't a demo. It wasn't even a professionally recorded demo. It wasn't done in a, a recording studio. It was just at home with a ghetto blaster, just a, a home tape machine sitting on top of a piano. The TV's on in the background. And apparently um, th- th- there's a hum on it as well. And there's crackling, so cracking mm-hmm. sound on the cassette on the sound because the the mains lead on the back of the boom box wasn't plugged in right and so there's all this kind of like weird you know crackling humming earth kind of like an earth hum sound coming through as well so yeah so i mean if you actually if you hear free as a bird and real love which were recorded on cassette as well if you listen to those songs the instrumentation that george paul and ringo have recorded it's great you know it's just it sounds like that it was recorded in the 90s in a recording studio it sounds clear it sounds pristine great but when you listen to john's voice on free as a bird and real love it it sounds tinny it you can tell that it's been taken off a cassette can't you it just sounds really distant it doesn't sound right you know almost ghostly almost ghostly yeah exactly um and back in the 90s you know, even the most sophisticated equipment that there was available back in the 90s was still not good enough to be able to get rid of that problem. But now, um, and, um, and yeah, now, it, it, here we are in 2023, and earlier in 2023, Paul and Ringo returned to Now and Then, which they'd put aside uh, in the 90s when they first worked on it with George, when he was still with us. And yeah, they used this mal software. Basically, they fed this demo, this crappy sounding demo with the background noise and all of that. They fed it through to mal and separated all the crap sounds, the background noise, the yeah, isolated John's voice on it on its own, cleaned it up. And then they added George's guitar from the original sessions when they worked on it in the 90s. And then Ringo put some fresh drums on it. They put backing vocals on it. I think Paul added, I think it was Paul and Ringo put some backing vocals on it. Um, got Paul's bass on there. And there's, there's orchestration as well, courtesy of um, Giles Martin as well. Um, so, yeah. And then um, I think it was in June of 2023, Paul announced that there was this new Beatles song coming out that's when it all of this started to come into the public domain um he didn't actually say it was going to be now and then though but I don't know about you Desiree but I'm I'm a Beatles nut I'm a Beatles freak and I knew instantly when he was talking when he was announcing that there was this quote unquote new Beatles song even though he didn't say what that song was I knew straight away well pretty much guessed 99.9 percent that it was going to be now and then because I think most um uh, you know down and dirty beatles fans beatles freaks they knew about they they knew about now and then uh, it, right. you know it'd been talked about in interviews by paul and um in the past over the decades uh, and, and of course it had been, and it had been released on on like bootlegs and stuff too yeah, so you exactly the ori- yeah the 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 rough demo version was out on bootlegs right. and stuff but um yeah so this is what he said to the bbc and this kicked off a stink This kicked off an AI controversy. Um, He said to the BBC in June, he said he, Peter Jackson, was able to extricate John's voice from a ropey little bit of cassette. We had John's voice and a piano and he could separate them with AI. They tell the machine, that's the voice. This is a guitar. Lose the guitar. So when we came to make it, it was a demo that John had and we were able to take John's voice and get it pure through this AI. Then we can mix the record as you would normally do. So it gives you some sort of leeway. So there's a good side to it and then a scary side. And we'll just have to see where that leads. <laughs> um, uh, Yeah, I mean, I don't know about you, but certainly after that announcement came out, there was I noticed uh, there was a couple of friends who sent me emails and I noticed on some Beatles blogs as well. And also in the mainstream media and to some extent in the alternative community and the alternative media there was a bit of a controversy a bit of a panic it was like oh my god ai you know uh, you know there was this there was this idea that there was suggestions that perhaps the track had been faked 
somehow with AI, AI that maybe Paul and Ringo, what they'd done was to fake John's voice to create a fake song, a computer generated fake song with an AI quote unquote fake John. Um, right. and of course, this all feeds and into George the. Too. Yeah. And it all feeds into all that, you know, the dangers of artificial intelligence. And he didn't do himself any favors. What I just quoted to you that 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 um, announcement he made it didn't he didn't do himself any favors by saying there's a good side to it and then a scary side, but um yeah and I I think he must have realized or maybe some of his closest aides realized that there was a bit of a controversy because some days after that he he went back onto social media to kind of quell the controversy, right? He, he went on Twitter and he said been great to see such an exciting response to our forthcoming Beatles project no one is more excited than us to be sharing something something with you later in the year we've seen some confusion and speculation about it seems to be a lot of guesswork going on out there can't say too much at this stage but to be clear nothing has been artificially or synthetically created it's all real and we all play on it we cleaned up some existing recordings a process which has gone on for years we hope you love it as much as we do. And um, Sean Lennon, John and Yoko's son, got in on the um, on the act as well to try and quell the controversy. Uh, he went onto Twitter and said, "All we did was clean the noise from the vocal track. Um, people are completely misunderstanding what occurred. There have always been ways of denoising tracks, but AI just does it better." Because it learns what the vocal is and is able to very precisely remove everything that is not the vocal. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's what he said. When you heard Now and Then, did you notice samples of old Beatles songs in the background? Yeah, not not it was, the first time hearing it. I um, the the new one, of course, Um there, there was a, it seemed like there was just something off about it. I, and I couldn't really put my finger on it, you know, but there, there was just, there was just something that didn't fit right when I first heard it. And I don't know exact, I still don't know exactly what that was, but it, yeah, there was like some, some extra stuff in there, it seemed like, or, or something. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, what Giles um, has done, Giles Martin has done, he's sampled, he's taken samples from old Beatles songs, like backing vocals, the Beatles doing harmonies, and added it in to the in song. There. Yeah. So it's, not only has it been cleaned up, the sound has been cleaned up with AI, but Giles Martin but has added. put some, added samples in it. Um, if you listen to it, apparently what he's, he says, if you listen carefully, you can hear backing vocals, harmonies from the songs here, there, and everywhere. Eleanor Rigby, and also mm -hmm. because which is from the Abbey Road album, which was mm -hmm. an which was essentially an a cappella song when it first came out in 1969. But yeah, I mean, I've I've spotted because I've heard I can hear that in the background that song, mm -hmm. but I, I don't think I've spotted here, there, and everywhere in Eleanor Rigby. But yeah, so not only has it been AI'd, but they've put samples in it as well, pretended that there's Beatles backing. Well, they well, it's not pretending. It is Beatles backing vocals, but they're not. They're, they're from they're from sixty right. odd years ago. You mentioned earlier w when I was talking about how back in the nineties they'd originally worked on this now and then and put it aside. You said that I remember you saying that the reason they did that was because they weren't happy with the quality. Um, right. I was just wondering, what do you mean by quality? Well, just just as you had um, said earlier, it was just it was like a. A cassette tape in a in a regular recording boombox, nothing fancy, and it's something that anybody could get at the store, not at the done at the recording studio, and it was just very poor quality, really hard to hear what he was saying. Um, the tape itself was really old, yeah. you know, and um, packed away, I think, in like um, John and Yoko's basement or closet or something for years and years, and. Um, just a really poor quality and if that boom box too was on top of the piano and he's playing the piano there's going to be vibrations yeah. i'm sure there was all kinds of background noise um in there that wasn't wasn't um usable or wasn't able to hear john as well as as they would like i'm sure yeah because i seem to remember um back a few years ago when because this has been it's been discussed 
with uh, um, Beatle anoraks, train spotters, if you like, sad Beatles fans that, you know, <laughs> follow all this stuff. Um, right. It's been discussed for years now that there was now and then that this song now and then existed. And I seem to remember back a few years ago on chat forums or wherever I saw or heard or read about this, that the reason they didn't release it, it was because George Harrison hated it. Um, and mm -hmm. the quote I remember was, pardon my French, he thought it was fucking crap. That's the, actu <laughs> that's the actual quote. And Sounds like something he would say. It does, doesn't it? And <laughs> and yeah, apparently Paul McCartney, um, in an interview that I only saw a few weeks ago, um, it's it was an interview that he he did for um, Jeff Lynne. There was a, a BBC documentary that came out about ten or so years ago, and it was a documentary in tribute to Jeff Lynne, who of course is from ELO, and he's the guy that actually produced "Free as a Bird" and "Real Love." Did uh, worked on those um, tracks that. George and Ringo and Paul had worked on back in the nineties and were released. Uh, and they, and he was also at the sessions for those night uh, for the recording originally of now and then with George Ringo and Paul back in the nineties when they were working on now and then back then, and then right. put it to one side. Um, I haven't seen the whole documentary, but I've seen the bit where Paul's talking about, he actually talks about now and then in it. Um, and he, ha he actually says, um, and I'm paraphrasing, he says, yeah, yeah, we were working on this other song uh, as well as Free as a Bird and Real Love. There was another song and it was called uh, Now and Then. Um, but um, we put it to one side because George said it was fucking rubbish. <laughs> um, but there seems to be some backtracking on that now, um, because now when you look at what the Beatles camp are saying, they're saying, oh, no, 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 George liked it. It's not, he, he didn't think the song was fucking crap. He thought the sound quality was crap. Right, right. Um, so, you know, I, I've got this feeling that they're backtracking and, and they've put statements out. Um, George's wife, his widow, um, Olivia's put, uh, made a video to try and um, put her case across. And there's uh, right. a quote from her on the Beatles official website. Um, and I, where they're kind of trying to explain that no 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 he liked the song honestly um if he was alive now he would have been you know he would have been a, he would have been supportive of this and i i don't know the cynic in me seems to is thinks to you know, the cynic in me thinks that he didn't like the song and because yeah. it, it, it's like it's almost dishonorable it's like they're going behind his they're going against his you know they're dishonoring his memory basically by releasing this song, they release basically they've gone in and worked on it anyway, irrespective of what George would have thought. And it's like it's kind of in bad taste for someone right. who, who passed away and didn't want it to come out. But here they are cashing in on it, kind of yeah, thing. Anyway. So yeah, um, on the Beatles official just, webs, uh, yeah, go yeah, go for it. I was just saying, I was I I kind of feel the same. I mean, I I am a Beatles fan, and I you know that that song it's it's really not that great. <laughs> In my in my humble opinion, and I'm not a musician, and I'm not, you know, it's it's really not a good song, you know, and I, I it, it's definitely Beatlesque, yeah. And I can hear, you know, that's definitely John Lennon, and and that's that was the style back then, you know, what he was trying to do. But you know, it's just to the way they hyped it up and everything, you know, I thought it was going to be this great song. And it was just kind of like, oh, yeah. Or, you know, it's it's for a final Beatles song. It's just kind of, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> I don't think it's going to be the final Beatles song. I think they're going to start right. doing stuff. Um, I was listening to a podcast the other week. With, it was a mainstream podcast, a mainstream Beatles podcast. Um, I think it's called Things We Said Today. Um, and a couple of the guys that were talking on there said they were invited to Apple um, to a hotel in New York, I think it was where Apple premiered the song a day before it was released or a week before it was released. Um, mm. And they were told in no uncertain terms when they were there, it was announced that there's more to come. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I don't know what that means, whether that means they're going to start messing around with other songs from George and John who have passed away and start, you know, I, I don't know what, what that means, but um, right. 
So do do you think it's actually John on that singing on there? Because there are some people on on um, alternative chat forums that think that might not be John that's on now and then. Yeah, mm. or or it's so digitally, um, or so um, computerized in a way that it, it it it's 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 almost like the free as the bird. It's but even more so. It's a kind of a ghostly sound. It's not. It's not. Um, as robust as yeah you know how i remember john lennon's um, because his voice sounds high sort of high high not, yeah. high not high pitched not like squeaky but very high in the range right like it's somebody else i don't know i don't know yeah it is it's it's eerie it's an yeah. eerie kind of a sound it's kind of like oh is that yeah i don't know like i said before well, the first time i heard it there there was just something off about it that I didn't it didn't it didn't sit well with me in a way you know it was just kind of like oh I I don't know that I like this song you know it's just kind of I don't know didn't do it for me I guess I gotta admit I like it you do (laughs) I do and the thing is when I heard the demo years ago I hated it and when I Mm -hmm. found out that when I started to guess when it was announced in June that when Paul said that there was going to be this new Beatles song quote unquote and I I instantly thought yeah that's now and then my next Mm -hmm. thought was oh no I hate that song that's awful (laughs) but I don't know I just like what they've done to it and I liked it straight away um yeah I I I I heard it once and that was enough and it's still in my head now and that came out in November we're recording this in December and it's in my head almost every single day I can't get it out of my head it's like like earworm that just won't go um yeah it's really weird that's uh, kind of scary too. That is kind of scary. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, with this backtracking, Olivia on on the um, Beatles official website, um, she states that no, 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 George would have loved this song. Uh, no, no, it's not the song he hates. She says, back in 1995, after several days in the studio working on the track, George felt the technical issues with the demo were insurmountable and concluded that it was not possible to finish the track to a high enough standard. If he were here today, Danny, that's their son, and I know he would have wholeheartedly joined Paul and Ringo in completing the recording of Now and Then. Um, And yeah, and then there was this video that she put up on social media um, where she says, we were in this store and George saw this clock made out of bits and pieces and it had some Scrabble letters and it just said Now and Then. He was attracted to it for some reason. He just took it off the wall and bought it. And uh, he he, he um, put it in his garden and the, uh, the clock stayed in the garden in this little area. Uh, it, it sat there for 25 years, she says. Anyway, she then goes on, roll on to the summer of 2022. And she says, the phone rings. It's Paul McCartney. And he begins to explain, reminding me of this third song that was on the cassette tape with Real Love and Free as a Bird. I said, oh, I remember it. It's called Now and Then. And I'm standing there looking at the clock. We were so (laughs) moved and happy that this thing that George had held in his hand somehow magically appeared. And I said, I think this is Georgie saying it's okay. Um, Yeah. Don't know what you make of that. Um, That's pretty eerie. Yeah. And the clock is on the, um, if if you buy the CD single or the vinyl cover, it's, it's, it's on there. The clock is on there um yeah so. picture of it yeah with lots of uh interesting little tidbits yeah it's numbers weird numbers and dice and yeah what you make of it at the top yeah i i looked at it and i looked at the numbers and that were on there and i couldn't really make heads or tails of it as far as like being an occult kind of a thing i think that the yeah. whole story behind it that olivia presented um gives it enough of a a Beatles coincidence, you know, all on its own. But um but yeah, just it's a it's very strange. And just the fact that George happened upon that and bought it, like the, you know, that story could be embellished a little bit, I think. Yeah. Yeah. You know. But yeah, I don't know. The dice on there with the five instead of Four, I, you yeah, know, who knows? yeah, um, 
yeah, it's it's. I've looked at it and tried to see if there's any like occult clues on there. Basically, for anyone who who hasn't seen it, I mean, you, you if you just anyone who's listening to this, if they just type in now and then Beatles, I'm sure it'll come up on a on you know on a image search if you type in CD cover or something like that. Now and then, it's basically a clock. It's rectangular size, but standing up, so it's a rectangle standing up, and at the bottom of it. Um, there's like a, a ruler, like a, a bit of a ruler that's been cut off and that's kind of stuck at the bottom. Um, a wooden ruler. Then on the above that, there's a picture of the Beatles from 1963. That's obviously been added to um, right. after they bought it. Um, I don't think, <laughs> I don't think the coincidence would have gone that far. Ahead. You know, it, yeah, I don't think George would have walked in the shop and seen that. I don't think the coincidence, the magic and all of that, this synchronicity would have been that strong. Um, well, and, didn't, didn't Olivia say that 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 that, was, that picture was on it? And that's why he does bought she? it? I, I don't know. I thought I wasn't, that that's what it said in the statement. Did it? Oh, well, maybe I, I missed it when I was reading it. I wasn't paying attention. I, I could um, be mistaken. Let me just look. Let me just, um, just looking at my bits of paper here where I've got it. No, she doesn't ma- mention the picture. No. She mentioned okay. scra- Scrabble letters and it's a, it, that it's a clock. Um, but I don't know if they are Scrabble letters. Because above that picture of the Beatles, you've got then w- written, you've got four different square chips um, right. with T on one chip, H on another, E on another, and N on another. Um, but Scrabble, I always thought Scrabble letters were a white background and black letters but these are white letters with a black background do you get scrabble letters like that i've never seen them like that and usually the scrabble letters will have numbers next to the letter for a point value yeah you know so um yeah i'm not not sure maybe she was mistaken or who knows yeah (laughs) that's 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 a bit odd and then above that you've got um a domino or when i first saw it I thought it was a dice, um, two dice stuck together. But we, we we were swapping emails, Desiree, and you said, no, that's a domino. I went, oh, God, yeah. Oh, God, how stupid. Um, so you've got then, and this is where I think there might be a Paul is dead clue, okay? Go with me on this. <laughs> I might be stretching it, but it says, okay, so you've got the, the so-called Scrabble letters that say then, and then above that, you've got two pairs of Scrabble numbers um, no, two. You've got a, a domino. You've got a domino, and so you've got um, two sets of domino numbers. Um, and the bottom set next to the word "then" is a two. And then if you look on the top part, it's three dots. So you've got "then" the word, and then above that, um, a domino um, with two dots. So two. And then above that, you've got three dots. So three. So and then above the three the domino where it says three above that you've got in Scrabble letters, um, letters spelling out the word now. Okay. Now go with me on this. I might be stretching it, but if you look then, okay. So then, and then above it, you've got two dots. So that means back then when they first worked on the song, there were, um, there were two dead. Okay. Right. Mm-hmm. Or no, two alive. Right. George and Ringo. Okay. And now, where it says three, now there's only one alive, Ringo, because George, John, and Paul are dead. Right. Right. Does that make sense? If Could we're be. going da- down that PID road, um, you're going that way. <laughs> yeah. And that's pretty much as far as I've got with that. I mean, as you say, at, on on the top, there's a key right at the top of the clock. Above the clock, right. there's like a roof, um, which looks like a triangle. So it could mm-hmm. be a pyramid. It could be a pyramid. And in the middle of that triangle, there's a key that could be Masonic. It could be a Masonic key to the mysteries or but I, I'm really okay. stretching it now. But um, <laughs> yeah, so, I, I, not necessarily. It's the, you know, the key to the symbolism or something. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. That's the key as... to everything. Yeah. <laughs> That's as far as I've Yeah, so the, the dominoes in total equal five, right? Two and the three. 
So there's the four Beatles plus the one. You could look at it that way too. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> and it, plus and it, the extra Paul McCartney. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and the time says um, uh, thirteen fifty or one fifty ten to two. So I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. On the clock. Interesting. Yeah. Um, another thing that you picked up on that you yourself picked up on was the day that it was released, that the actual song was released to be bought that you on the, the day it actually came out for anyone to buy it. Um, it was November it was the 2nd, November the 2nd. It was announced mm -hmm. to the world on November 1st, uh, uh, not announced. It was premiered. The song was premiered on November 1st and it was available to buy on November 2nd, which was a right. Friday. Now in, I don't know about in the States, but in, in, in the UK, a Friday is not an unusual day to release a new song, um, a new single or album. In fact, most singles and albums are released on Fridays because the UK singles and albums chart comes out on a Friday. So basically, if you right. release your album or single on a Friday, that gives you seven days, seven full days to sell enough to get into the next week's chart. But as you pointed out, November the 1st, and especially November 2nd, is a very important day in the Mexican calendar to people in Mexico and people living outside of Mexico. Because it's right. November 2nd is Dia de los Muertos. In other words, right. the Day of the Dead. Day, day of the Dead, yeah. Yeah, it's a bit, it's a huge, it's huge in Mexico. And um, me being in San Diego, I'm, you know, pretty much a border town here to Mexico. And it, it's pretty big here as well. And so um, as soon as I saw, and it, it's big for me too, and in, in the flower business as well. Because um, you sell flowers. Everybody buys flowers for their, you know, their their loved ones who have passed. So, um, so yeah, I, it stood out to me right away that it was um, Day of the Dead. But it, I just figured that they would release it more on a, you know, a significant date, but that might be very significant, especially, um, I believe that, uh, Olivia is Mexican. Hispanic is Mexican, right? She's, she's Mexican. So, yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah. Olivia Arias. That was how she was born. Olivia Arias. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. So interesting that. Born in America, you know. but to a Mexican family. Yeah. Okay. Yeah yeah I, so, I don't know knows? i don't know how right or wrong i am but november the first is part of that day of the dead holiday so it's a, it's a celebration in a way november the first right. on, honors the deceased children and november 2nd is deceased adults so right. you could you could say john and george and paul if you want to go down that road <laughs> um, right but yeah very important day apparently on that day um from the little research i've done into it um you build little altars in your home or you can put them out in public little altars with mementos of your loved ones or friends you knew mm -hmm. little mementos that they had themselves they owned themselves or little mementos representing things that they liked um and you go visit grave sites on those days and the street festivals and special foods they make and as you say flowers and right. uh, lots of flowers being bought and um, displayed and when i look at that clock that now and then clock um and anyone who hasn't seen it go take a look and you know see what you think it does look a bit right. like an altar it does yeah yeah it does in a way because definitely it's got, some kind of an homage yeah because yeah. it's got the picture of the beatles on the bottom of it as well right um do you and, want to say and thinking thinking about it again since um we discussed that that picture being added it kind of strange too that they would have chosen that picture if it wasn't already there just be i guess you know being the then part of it you know but there there's so many pictures of the beatles and why they chose that particular one is kind of interesting as well yeah so i don't know i'll have to think about that some more mock top beatles <laughs> yeah direct that that is their beetle mania image that's the collarless jackets with the mock top hair that's definitely a 1963 picture a very early picture of early early fame years picture right yeah um right, right. what do you th what do you think about i am a phony getting in on this um of course i am a phony aka rotten apple this youtube channel that is very pid heavy that's been putting up occult pid 
quote unquote clues since the 2000s. Um, I am a phony got in on the act um, because it had the actual full version of now and then, because the version that we hear, the official version is actually a chopped down version because the original version has got an extra verse in it. And that was taken taken out of the official version. There's a part in it where John sings, I don't want to lose you. No, no. And then he goes off. There's some more lyrics to that. It goes on for about another minute or two. But they chopped that out of the official Beatles version. Um, Right. But I spotted in, in, in October of 2023, so a good month before the official version came out, um, I am a phony had on their um, YouTube channel this the full version, the full now and then song, but it was called "I Don't Want to Lose You." It was it was titled, it was listed as "I Don't Want to Lose You" um, on there, um, and right. I think we might have talked about this before. I'm not sure. I've certainly talked about it in previous podcasts elsewhere. I, I'm not sure if we talked about this on Magical Mystery Talk, but. And this is thanks to Redwell Trabant of the site Beatles Conspiracy. I think it was Redwell Trabant who discovered some business records from back in the day that links I Am A Phony, a.k.a. Rotten Apple, to Neil Aspinall, who was another Beatles insider. I mean, he was such an insider to the extent that, I mean, you want to talk about insider, you know, he, he he went to school with George and Paul. He mm-hmm. was there. He was one of their first road managers in the pre-fame years. He stayed with them and was their roadie in the Beatlemania years through the touring years. And then after they stopped touring, he eventually went on to run their business, Apple. Um, right. And he was like their CEO. He was like their top man at Apple. And basically in the post split years, if he was like their gatekeeper. If you wanted, if if you were somebody, a journalist or a filmmaker or a director or producer or whatever, and you wanted to speak to the Beatles as an entity about a project, you had to get through Mal. Uh, you had to get through Neil in order to mm-hmm. make that happen. He was the gatekeeper up until he passed away in the 2000s. Um, so, yeah, his name has been linked to I Am A Phony. And the reason I'm mentioning that is because if you listen, well, first off, how is it that for, I mean, I only spotted it in October. It might've been there before, but how is it that I am a phony, AKA rotten apple managed to have this song up on YouTube and it didn't get taken down. Um, right. As, as is all of their, they, they use he or he or the entity. Um, I am a phony uses Beatles songs all the time. Yeah. And anybody who uses anything Beatles on YouTube gets taken down almost immediately. And they're, they have been playing for years and years and years and years without any um, cancellation, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, very, very interesting. You know, even even irrespective of the Beatles, I mean, if I've, I've tried uploading videos in the past where and 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 it won't allow me to release the video that I want to release that I've uploaded because apparently there's a copyright infringement and I'm thinking, where's the copyright infringement? I don't remember any. Co-. And, and I eventually find it and it's like something that's like four seconds long or 10 seconds long. And it's, right. it's like a little piece of film footage or a little song playing in the background. You can hardly hear it, you know, right. but you can, it's so, so distant in the background. It's faint. But YouTube picks up on it and won't allow me to put the video up. And right. so how does he get, how does this I am a phony get past all this? And if you've listened to this, I don't want to lose you. Like I said before, up before Now and Then was officially released, the only version of Now and Then that you could find online was the demo. And it right. sound, and the demo sounds crackly. It sounds crap. It sounds like a, a cassette. But if you right. listen, if you listen to "I Don't Want to Lose You," to me it sounds crystal clear. It it sounds like yeah. it's been put, it's been in a studio and it's been cleaned up. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was it was crystal clear when I heard it in October or whenever it was released. Yeah, that that was. Yeah, interesting. And the and the um, he always has a video with it, you know, uh, yeah. or 
they always have a video with it, however you want to say it. But, um, and using all of that, the AI technology was pretty interesting in the video as yeah. well. And so I think that that kind of, um, at least in our little um, Beatles controversial world um, that we belong to, that that raised a lot of eyebrows as well as, as far as the AI um, was concerned with the song. And then, and then it being so similar to the actual release that the Beatles did a month later, that was pretty yeah. um, eyebrow raising. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I forgot to mention that it's actually it's not the demo. It's not just John on a piano. It's actually got instrumentation on the top of it. It's got drums. It's got backing yeah. vocals, um, guitars. Maybe I can't remember now. But it sounds like it was done in a studio, like a top yeah. notch state of the art studio. It sounds almost like it does it sounds almost like the version that that came out officially released yeah. yeah very very similar very similar but but like you said it had that extra little um bridge or that you know yeah. the actual little verse in there and i think that the part that they left out of the original beatles or the um official beatles version he said i don't want to lose you i don't want to abuse you and yeah. i think that that's why they took it out yeah but that was left in the i am a phony um version yeah so interesting yeah that is weird also um released on the same day as now and then was the repackaged um and remixed compilations the beatles 1962 to 1966 the two double albums that originally came out in 1973 one of which was the beatles 1962 to 1966 and the other one was the beatles 1967 to 1970 i mean they're, mm -hmm. they're the albums that got me into the beatles when they came when those albums came out i was three four years old Same. so i i didn't live through the beatles years when they were together um so i wouldn't have remembered any of that but my sister's 10 years older than me so she would have been 13 14 and she had those albums and i just instantly made a beeline for those ran to the record player and picked those up and played them constantly um, right when I was quite young uh, that was like my gateway drug those albums those two albums <laughs> um, and they're nicknamed the red and the blue albums right um, red because, pill and the blue pill yeah exactly um, <laughs> it's called yeah because the the, the 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 album 1962 to 1966 has a red border around the cover and 67 to 70 compilation has a blue border around it you could also say it's as people have said now the uh, Actually, I was going to say the official version, but I don't think there's actually an official explanation. But this is as close as some people have got to explaining why they're red and blue and their nicknames, the red and blue albums. It's been said the reason that they they went for those two colors for the uh, those colors for those covers um, was because it's a tribute to Liverpool from where the Beatles mm. came from. So it's the two, it's basically representing the two biggest Liverpool football teams, the two biggest football teams in Liverpool, those being Liverpool FC football club, which who are red, wear red. Mm. And then you've got Everton who wear blue. Um, but yeah, you say the red pill and the blue pill. Um, mm -hmm. I was on a podcast uh, uh, some months back. Um, I was on, uh, I was invited to take part in the sheep farm uh, to as a guest on sheep farm studios podcast with dom and chris and they said to me red and blue pill as well um, mm. they, they suggested that and they and, and the way they put it was yeah of course what they're doing here is they're saying well which pill do you want do you want the red pill do you want to go down the the 1962 to 1966 route you know cute lovable mm -hmm. mop tops era the I want to hold your hand and she loves you and all of that. Or do you want to take the blue pill and go down 67 to 1970? Do you want to take that pill and go down the psychedelic, you know, longer hair, rocked out kind of hippie thing? You, yeah. could, also, you could also say it's the red and blue lodges of Freemasonry. That's mm -hmm. been, that's been said as well. And if you think about Freemasonry, um, actually, if you, Fast forward to, I think it was 1987 or 88, can't remember now. Um, there was another official um, series of compilation albums that came out. Again, two compilation albums that came out simultaneously. And they were basically all, that, that those compilations were tracks that were non-album tracks. So basically, it was basically two compilations made up of tracks from B-sides, um, mm. 
and, and some A sides, just basically tracks that weren't featured on their albums. Um, and they were called Past Masters Volume right. One, Volume Two. Again, so we've got this Freemasonic thing going on, you might say, because Past Masters, from what I understand, um, right. in Freemasonry, if you've been a worshipful master and then you and then you stand down from that role, then you are known as a Past Master. Right. I don't know. Um, right. And if, and if you look at the cover artwork on those two albums, they're black and white as well the so black got, and white yeah. and i believe if i if i'm not mistaken there's um between the two albums the past masters albums volume one and volume two there's 33 total tracks oh. on it which is a big um freemason yeah um number yeah so, so yeah to, so to be the highest degree in freemasonry but um there's, there's probably more than that you know, they, that's that's what they tell us within right. the freemasonry world that there's 33 it's probably more than that um yeah um and with regards to the um the blue and the red album what what Giles Martin has done is he's done the mal thing again he's done the ai he's given that the ai treatment as well um if you listen to for example i saw her standing there um the drums are really up in the mix so like the mm. first thing you notice when you listen to i saw her standing there this new ai remix that Giles Martin has done on the red album and it actually wasn't on the original red album it wasn't originally on the 1962 to 66 compilation that came out in 1973 this oh, new they added it. they've added it this new remixed re-release has got extra tracks on it um but yeah this is one of the extra tracks and what they've done he's turned the drums up on it it's really loud it's like it's the first thing that hits you you know when you hear it you think oh wow drums there's lots of drums going on there really hear that um but he's really when you listen to I Am The Walrus, you know, at the end of the song, I Am The Walrus, you've got the radio. Um, you've got the radio tuning. And you've got an excerpt from right. a radio, um, from a radio program. Um, what John Lennon did when he was recording the song. So the story goes at the end, uh, at, during the sessions, when he recorded the song, what he did was he added, he he, he wanted to put a, um some radio tuning on the end of it, just the sound of a radio tuning up and down the dial. So what he basically did, what we're told is he just brought in a radio set and just put it next to a microphone and just started randomly tuning the radio. Um, and this feeds into PID because, and this, so if it feeds into PID, that would mean that it's not random, that it was put there deliberately because what he picks up on, whilst he's tuning the radio is um, uh, a BBC play, a BBC adaptation of uh, King Lear. And if you listen to the words that the, the section that you hear at the end of I am the walrus, that, that is the, the radio tuning. If you listen to the excerpt that is taken that you hear of King Lear, it refers to death. And it has been said that the reason that John Lennon put it on there was no, it wasn't random. It was put on there because it was um, another reference to um, Paul dying. Another clue. Another clue to Paul dying in 1966. Um, right. And but what's what's happened is if you listen to and you can hear it clearly, but if you listen to the new remixed AI Mal version that Giles Martin has released or re and remixed. You can't hear it anymore. It's gone. Um, it's you can you can hear a radio tuning, but you can't hear that that section from King Lear where it says, "Slave, thou hast slain me, villain, take, take my, my purse. purse." If ever thou wilt try, bury my body, and give the letters which thou findst about me to Edmund Earl of Gloucester. Seek him out upon the British party. Oh, untimely death. I know thee well, a serviceable villain, as duteous to the vices of thy mistress as badness would desire. What? Is he dead? Sit you down, father. Rest you. So, again, the cynic in me, here comes the cynic in me again, would say, did they do, did, did Giles Martin do that deliberately because to throw off the scent of any future generations because if this the, the, the reason that they might have re reissued this um blue and red album uh, yeah it's 50 years since it first came out but 
maybe what they're doing here by remixing it and adding extra tracks is using it like a gateway drug again in order to introduce it to the next lot of three, four, five year olds. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. anyone who is three, four, five years old listening to this or a little bit older and hears I'm the walrus for the first time won't be aware that that King Lear was on there because it's not there anymore. So right. it's all, it's almost like they're brainwashing the public to think, oh no, there's, there's you know, you know, it's like they're playing. Think... Yeah, it's like they're playing with Paul is dead. It's like they're um yeah. Rewriting history. Rewriting history, rewriting PID. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, and and to me that that little um King Lear part at the end, it, that really makes the song. Without yeah. it being in there, it, it's just it's not the same. And um you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I think they did a real disservice by keeping that out. And especially since if, if the Mal technology can really isolate all those things, they could have really cleaned it up and made it exactly. even, you know, instead of just leaving it out altogether. That's yeah. And, and I thought the whole point of this Mal software um, was to clean the sound, not delete and erase. Do you know what I mean? It, right. was, it was there basically to clean the sound up and to make it, like you say, to hear it better, not to, because mm. if you hear it, I mean, I might be hearing it wrong, but I've listened to it about two or three times now just to make sure that I'm not hearing it wrong because I can't quite believe it, but it's not there anymore. That, that King Lear, all you hear is like a radio tuning, but you don't hear King Lear anymore. Right. It's, it's really, uh, and apparently Charles Martin says, oh, we cleaned it up. That's what we did with the radio tuning and, but no, you haven't cleaned it up, mate. You've you've actually no, you deleted de- it. Deleted it. Um, right. Weird. Really weird. Um, right. And to and to me, in my own conspiratorial mind, that is just it's just instead of um, you know not introducing the PID to the future generations to this generation, that's it's like a big slap in the face in a way, like you know, that, that, that was a bit, that was one of the really big clues, right. To yeah. Paul is dead. Yeah. And so by taking that out, it's, it's just kind of more solidified that, you know, that was done purposely and not randomly like yeah. John had supposedly claimed, but that's just me. <laughs> yeah. It's just us. We're just cynical. Yeah. We're just like <laughs> cynical. Ah. Yeah. Okay. So moving along then lots of books <clears throat> coming out, lots of, books uh that have been released beatles related in november and october um Mm -hmm. uh and one of those books uh which came out on december 8th on the day that john lennon was uh shot of course um is uh the book about uh john lennon's killing uh mind Mm -hmm. games the assassination of john lennon which is by david whelan and as you know Mm -hmm. desiree i interviewed him um about as we're recording this it's december 18th uh i think i recorded the the interview with him about three or four weeks ago and it's up online it's on my youtube page conspiro tv it's also available on my website the occult beatles he has said to me that he wants to come back and speak because he only spoke to me that time but he he, I, i did ask him whether he'd come back and speak to you and me and mark together and he says you know once the book is out and he says yeah yeah that'd be great would love to do that yeah i would love that so yeah, that that's to come. Um, the first I heard of this, or hopefully it's to come if if he sticks to it. Um, the first I heard about this new book, which challenges the official narrative, was in April 2023 when it appeared in which uh, appeared on a on a news website, which, as as far as I'm aware, is the the UK's most popular, most viewed news website, mainstream news website. Um, it's the Mail Online. Um, mm-hmm. so I was quite shocked to see this being reported, you know, this upcoming, this then upcoming book being reported in the mail online on the mail online, because, you know, this is like super, super mainstream. This, this is, right. um, David Whelan's like taking an alternative look, uh, away from the official narrative. And I was quite surprised to see it reported there, but, um, yeah, this is what the report said. I've got it typed out here. A three-year investigation. Uh, the, the headline reads, could the man jailed for John Lennon's murder be innocent? 
New documentary says a second gunman could have fired fatal shots and questions whether killer Mark Chapman was brainwashed by CIA. I mean, this wow, this is like a super mainstream news source bringing this out. Right. Main headline. Um, incidentally, it mentions a documentary there. Uh, if you listen to my chat with David, he I did ask him about this. Um, the book is out. It came out December 8th, but there is going to be a documentary as well. Hopefully it'll be out in 2024 so the news report reads and i quote a three-year investigation into the murder of john lennon has unearthed a series of extraordinary inconsistencies including the suggestion that detectives may have fundamentally misunderstood how the shooting happened british author and tv producer david whelan has exhaustively examined lennon's fatal shooting on december 8th 1980 as he and his wife yoko ono returned to their home in the dakota building overlooking new york central park and intriguingly whelan's research for a forthcoming book into the former beatles death has raised a series of troubling questions about how exactly the killing was carried out and why. Mr. Whelan has spoken to key figures involved in the aftermath of the shooting. These include the surgeon who treated Lennon and two nurses who assisted, as well as uncovering other witness testimonies which don't appear to correspond with the official narrative. The prosecution's version of events accepted by the courts was that disturbed loner Chapman lay in wait for Lennon and shot five times, four of the bullets hitting his victim in the back. But this now appears to be riddled with contradictions. Well, now appears. No, no, no. It's been, it's, been, mm. it's not only now it's appeared. Anyway, anyway, instead, Whelan's witnesses suggest. Right. That, <laughs> yeah. Instead, Whelan's witnesses suggest that the way the shooting was officially recorded may have been completely wrong with the fatal shots fired into Lennon's chest rather than in his back. The surgeon who treated Lennon and the t- oh, we covered a lot of this in our our own podcast special, didn't we? Back in 2020, we did that four hour two parter into John Lennon's mm-hmm. assassination. Me, you and Mark covered a lot of this ground. Um, the surgeon who treated Lennon and the two nurses who assisted are all adamant that Lennon was shot in the front with the four bullets grouped closely together, suggesting a high degree of marksmanship and three passing straight through his body and out of his rear shoulder. Other evidence gleaned by Whelan about those who may have influenced Chaplin, uh, Chapman has led him to question whether the young man might have even been groomed for the assassination through manipulation mm. or even hypnosis by powerful backers with links to right-wing Southern Christians, the US military or the CIA. Whelan points to the first-hand witness statements by that surgeon who worked on John in the in the hospital, Dr. David Halloran, and the two nurses, Barbara Camera and D. Sato, or D. Sato, all of whom state unequivocally that Lennon was shot four times in his upper chest area from the front, with three of the bullets exiting from his left back. One remained in his left chest or lower shoulder area. Uh, Whelan also questioned uh, Chapman's own recollection of the night's events and quoting Whelan here, he could not coherently understand why he felt compelled to shoot John Lennon. Chapman did not remember pulling the hammer or aiming. Uh, All he could remember was a voice in his head saying, do it, do it. Um, Hmm. And New York police department, Lieutenant Arthur O'Connor stated that Chapman appeared programmed on the night he shot Lennon. Um, Chapman even now is adamant that he shot John Lennon four times in his back from five attempts. But Whelan said, And I quote, it's something I suggest from firsthand medical uh, testimony he could not have credibly done. Therefore, we can assume that Chapman was possibly having some kind of psychotic episode, which enabled him to think he was doing something he couldn't have done. I think Mark Chapman was potentially shooting a gun or thinking he was shooting a gun, possibly uh, blanks. He thinks Mm. he's done something he couldn't have possibly done. Therefore, the only conclusion I can come to is there might have been a second shooter or it was highly likely there was a second shooter shooting John in a close group pattern in his upper left chest area. When I spoke to the doctors and nurses at the time who treated John and they saw his wounds many times, they all agree that whoever shot John was very close to him and standing in front one or two feet away. And they managed to achieve a very professional grouping around John's left chest area above his heart. It's almost impossible for Mark Chapman to do that from where he was. And it was dark. He was 20 to 25 feet away from John. 
It's a disturbing, troubling assessment. I'm, I'm well aware of that, but I can see no other explanation for John's wounds. Hmm. So, yeah. I don't know your thoughts on, on David Whelan, his investigations, what he's come up with. I haven't yet read the book. I haven't even bought right. it yet. I haven't ordered it. I don't even have it yet. Um, I don't know. You've heard the interview that I did with him. Uh, I don't know what I did hear thought. an interview. Yeah. yeah. And I, I've been through his, um, like his YouTube page and his, all of his articles and stuff and the interview that he did and all of that. So I've seen all of that. Um, yeah. I, I mean, it's all the stuff that we've, you know, previously discussed and other um, researchers have previously previously discussed. And um, I, I hope that it's, you know, really is coming to more of a mainstream thing and there'll be more um, awareness raised around it. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know the motive, you know, is it just, he really is interested and he really yeah. wants to uncover these things or is it, is it something else altogether? I'm not quite sure. Yeah. I'm not, I, I'm not giving him a full, a full hooray at this point, but again, I ha I also haven't read the book either. Yeah. And so I, I think I, before I form any um, firm opinions on that, I'll have to wait till I read the book and see what it really uncovers or doesn't. Yeah. Because I, I, my instant thought was when I first read that in the made online back in April of 2023, my first thought, well, my first reaction was surprise because mm. this has never happened before. You know, jo you know, we, we've we've seen the JFK shooting get a little bit of you know, uh, you know, versions of the JFK shooting that challenge the official narrative. We've seen that to a, a big extent being put out there in the mainstream media. But when it comes to John right. Lennon, it's, I don't think it's ever happened before. Um, right? No. It's it, it so that shocked me when I read that first in eight in back in April. I, I was surprised, and then I started to think like you. I got a little bit suspicious. I thought one or two, well, one or three things could be going on here. Either a, um, they're going to set him up for a fall. So basically, they've got David Whelan to, and I I put this to him in the interview when I spoke to him. I said, "Have you have you thought about the fact that they might have put you up, set you up to bring you down?" So that here they are pushing. Here's a mate the the UK's most popular news, mainstream news source. And I think the, that's the Mail Online. And the Mail Online is connected to the Daily Mail newspaper, which is the best selling newspaper in Britain as we speak, as far as I'm aware. Right. So here we have this entity with its huge audience, huge mainstream audience promoting this um, ch uh, version of history, which challenges the official narrative. And I said to David, I said, have you, have you thought about the possibility that, that they might be setting you up to bring you down? Um, so they're giving you loads of support now, but sometime in the future, they're going to do something to bring you down and take down the, the conspiracy theory with it, your, your, your investigations with it. Um, and he doesn't see that happening. Um, right. Okay. That's his opinion. I'm, I'm not there to challenge him. I'm, I'm just like a, I see myself as a reporter um, sure. basically just giving him his, platform to say what he thinks and then i just leave the listeners and the viewers who are watching and listening to it to make up their own mind the other possibilities of course he's a willing instrument in this to di di to discredit any challenges to the official narrative and of course the other option is he does actually care and that he's doing this genuinely out of some kind of genuine concern that he wants the truth or something as close to the truth as he can get to to come out um, right. Yeah. But yeah, I'll be interested now, to read the book. And I know you um, said it on your uh, in your blog and in an interview and whatnot. But what what is his background? Isn't he a journalist of some sort? Yeah, he started um, from very young. Um, it, w when he left school, he got a, a government um, apprenticeship scheme um, back in the 1980s to work at Thames Television, which is a regional um tv company um it's it's for london it was a it doesn't exist anymore it was it was a regional television broadcaster that provided local tv programs for london so news sport um local programs programs attached to london but it was also a huge tv uh, broadcaster for the whole of britain because it produced programs it uh, some mm -hmm. of the you know i can remember growing up in the 70s and 80s and 90s uh, you know, and and Thames television programs on the television, like hugely popular. 
programs, you know, dramas, sitcoms, chat shows, quiz shows, I mean, mm-hmm. uh, documentaries, you know, so he, he was right in the hub of it. Um, he, he was working in the news department, I think, researching. And then he moved into mm-hmm. the, he, he got out of it and he went independent and started working in sport. So I think that's really where he, he didn't really enjoy the local news aspect of it. He said he found it quite boring. He said, but um, yeah, for, for most of the eighties, he was working at Thames TV. Um, yeah. So that's, so super mainstream, super mainstream background initially. I think he's independent right. now, but um, yeah. Yeah. And that's how he got to, um, he managed to get this report into the mail online in April. Um, as he says in the interview to me, he's got contacts. He knows people who are, con- who are connected to the mail online. Right. And he asked them, is it possible if you can get this in your newspaper or on your, in your, you know, can you get them to put it in, in the daily mail oh, newspaper well. or on the mail yeah. online? Is there any chance? And they said, yeah, let's, let's have a look and see what we can do. And after lots of discussion and toing and froing um, between the two parties, between him and the mail online, yeah, they, but, well, this is what he says. And they, they eventually put it out there you know yeah um but yeah i was i was really surprised to see that uh, yeah um, interested to see if anything um comes of it yeah or if it just gets swept under the rug as usual yeah we'll see. as you say he's got a youtube page as well and he's got a substack yeah. page as well um and and on that substack page he's got a, a lot of the articles on there are actually taken from his book um, so he said, so he told me, um, and there's, there's various other articles on that Substack page, which, um, are not in his book. And he's also, um, going to continue with that Substack page, even though the book is out, he's going to continue, um, cause he's learning new stuff all the time, apparently. So every time he learns something new, he's going to keep putting it up on that Substack page. Anyone who's mm. interested, it's David Whelan, uh, dot substack.com and that's whelan w-h-e-l-a-n um and just to round this off um with regards to this book um this is this is how he announced the book when it came out on his substack page i think he said as most of you know i have been investigating john's assassination for over three years now Uh, i have spoken to everyone involved with the case and i have managed to access all the lead detectives notebooks and files I am relieved that all my work is now finally out there for the world to read. This book is just the start of a process for getting justice for John Lennon, though I believe my work has been um, has uncovered most of what really happened on 8th December 1980. There is still work to do. I urge everyone who reads the book to continue looking into the case. There are still unreleased FBI, CIA, NYPD and Manhattan DA's office files. Most released files are still heavily redacted. We must continue Mm -hmm. to seek the whole truth about the people behind John Lennon's assassination and their methods and motives. My writing will continue on Substack. There are plenty more subjects surrounding the case that need further exploring beyond my book. This is just the beginning. Okay. So, yeah. I hope so. Yeah. I hope so. See what happens. Um, Yeah. Another book that came out this year, not 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 around Christmas time. It was much earlier, I think, in July. And again, I interviewed the author of this. I had a, I, again, it's available at my site, The Occult Beatles, and also at Conspiro TV. Um, I interviewed the author of a book which is called Dead Groovy, and it's about the life of. It's about the life, career, and death, and some might say suspicious death of David Jacobs, who was uh, the lawyer in the sixties of the Beatles. He was also Brian Epstein's lawyer. Uh, Mm -hmm. He was also friends with, with Brian Epstein as well. Um, Officially. um, It's really weird actually, because as I said to the author, when I was chatting with him, um, there's not that much known about him, about David Jacobs. He he was known as like uh, the lawyer of the stars, the lawyer to the stars. But if you look online, apart from some news reports about his death, there's not that much known about him. And you would have thought there would have been because apparently he was a lawyer for um, Lawrence Olivier, the Beatles, Brian Epstein, Judy Garland, Marlena Dietrich, um, Liberace. Um, 
And yeah, there's very, very little online that you can find about him. Um, from what I understand, he committed suicide. Uh, and I say from what I understand, because again, this is just based on what the scant information that I've managed to find online. He committed suicide, I think, in December 1968. So about just over a year after Brian Epstein died of a quote unquote accidental overdose. Um, and he, he hung himself, apparently. So the story <laughs> goes, David Jacobs, officially speaking, hung himself in a garage in his home. But um, there has been and this is what the book li looks into. There has been some claims that he was actually murdered. Um, and this is something that was put forward by a friend of his, his goddaughter, uh, a film actress mm. back in the 60s by the name of Susanna Lee. Um, and she went to the police and said and and, and put uh, presented her her fears um, with regards to this. So put forward the suggestion that he was possibly murdered um, because she claimed that um, a couple of days after she learned of his suicide, a couple of days after he died or his reported suicide, uh, she got a postcard through her door from Jacobs asking her to go to lunch with her that week. Mm. I think it was. So she thought to herself, well, if, if he was going to kill himself, why, why is he, um, why is he sending right, me making plans? Yeah. Making plans to meet her for lunch. Um, mm -hmm. So there is this suggestion that he might have been murdered and what dead groovy looks at is kind of like a murder mystery kind of book. It tells you the story of his life. It, it explains his life story and, and some of the cases he was involved with and some of the people that he knew, but it also hones in on various people that he knew or dealt with as a lawyer um, who could be possible suspects if he was murdered. Um, and what they bring into it, they one of the aspects that they bring into this that that the author brings into this when he when he um, goes into possible suspects is the case that is is the um, the Beatles merchandising um, aspect of David mm -hmm. Jacobs' career and that that company that was created to handle the licensing of Beatles merchandising in the early to mid sixties, which was Cell Type, which is Beatles yeah. spelt backwards. Didn't you write an article about cell type? I did. Yeah. yeah. That that's <laughs> that was a that was a disaster, wasn't it? Cell type. That was really, really weird. A really Yeah, weird... very strange. And um and still is to this day. It's it hasn't really been fully explained and a whole bunch of people made money and yeah. That's very strange. Um uh, topic there for sure from what i understand so i think it was around sometime in 1963 when the beatles fame was really skyrocketing when we were getting so-called quote-unquote beatle mania and what was going on was a lot of people were cashing in on this people who weren't actually connected to the beatles um other uh bodies if you like other people were who weren't attached to the beatles in any way shape or form were cashing in making their own merchandising t-shirts dolls you name it, candy bars right. with wrappers with paper wrappers with the Beatles on the front. And um, and a lot of these people were approaching Brian before going ahead with these merchandising bits of paraphernalia and asking Brian for permission, you know, for a license to go ahead and do this. Uh, whilst others were just going ahead and doing it without asking him. So basically they were making money unofficially. But some right. were approaching Brian and asking him. And it got to the point where Brian just couldn't handle it anymore because there was so much going on at that point in the Beatles world, as it were, what with their skyrocketing fame. He, he just didn't have the time to deal with it. So he handed it over to his lawyer, um, uh, David Jacobs, to take a look at it. And what <laughs> yeah, what David Jacobs did essentially was hand it over to somebody else. He he couldn't hand he couldn't deal with it either. He was I'm assuming too busy to deal with it as well. So what he did, he got in contact with this guy called Nicky Byrne and Nicky Byrne and about six or five or six or seven other people formed this collective and they formed a company and they called it cell type, which is, as I say, Beatles spelled backwards. And this became this merchandising company that was, would license this Beatles merchandise from here on in. Um, and, and apparently um, what happened was this Nicky Byrne said to 
and this was going on and, and Brian Epstein didn't know this was going on. Nikki Byrne said to David Jacobs, oh, OK, well, we'll, we'll OK, we formed this company, Cell Type. We'll we'll do this for you. And we want 90 percent to 10 percent split of the take with the 90 mm-hmm. percent going to Nikki Byrne yeah. and his friends, not to right. Brian Epstein. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and David Jacobs said yes. Right. He said yes. Yeah, okay then. All right, we'll go with that. <laughs> I mean, what on earth? Right. What? I mean, yeah. Um, yeah. Just and they made a ton of money, a ton of it, a ton of it, and so yeah. I I'm a Beatles collector, and I have a lot of the old um, original merchandise. Um. And yeah, every time I'm like, oh, I wonder who's actually, who actually got the money for this. Nikki <laughs> Byrne probably. originally sold. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of sad. But Yeah. So what yeah. happened was after a couple of years, Brian Epstein thought, oh no, th- 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 oh my God. So he, he tried to shut the stable door after the whole horses bolted kind of situation. He said he, he decided to take um, cell type to court. So he got David Jacobs. I don't know if David Jacobs was involved in the court cases, but certainly Brian Epstein decided to get lawyers on the case and they took um, cell type to court to try and claw this deal back somehow and, and get a bigger cut of the share instead of just getting this 10 percent. And as a result, and and I was reading um, the, the Beatles biography Shout by Philip Norman the updated revised version. It originally came out in 1982. I'm not sure if it was in the 1982 version, but certainly in the updated version that came out decades later or some years later, there's uh, an interview with Nicky Byrne in it um, where he talks about all of this um, drama. And apparently, um, because these court cases were going on, um, what happened was a lot of business people got cold feet. They got they got nervous and pulled out of business deals. And a couple there was a couple of deals that were about to happen um, with regards to Beatles merchandise. And that was with um, a couple of department stores. Uh, Woolworths was one of them. And the other one was Penny's. Is that a U.S. department store? Yeah, yeah, it's now J.C. Penny. But yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because I'm not aware of it in the it doesn't exist in the U.K. I don't think Woolworths certainly did. That, that's gone now. That's that's. That's disappeared yeah, from, from yeah. That's disappeared from the high streets in Britain. Um, but yeah, uh, apparently those two stores were going to sell Beatles merchandise across the whole of the US, and mm-hmm. they'd gone into agreements with various suppliers who were going to supply them with the merchandise. And a lot of these suppliers, according to Nikki Byrne, um, invested so much money that when what happened was the department stores got really nervous when these court cases were going on. Um, between Brian Epstein and Cell Type, so they pulled out. They thought, no, no, this is this is you know they they, they thought that it was all going to go belly up. So they pulled out, and because they pulled out, a number of the suppliers that were, had invested heavily in this deal that was going to happen and that didn't happen went to the wall, went out of business. So Nikki Byrne puts forward, and and this is. And and this does tie into David Jacobs and Dead Groovy, this book, and a possible suspect for murder, uh, as a, a possible suspect who could have murdered um, David Jacobs. Uh, Nikki Byrne in Shout claims that um, in 1967, just shortly after the court case had stopped, had all the court cases had stopped and a settlement had been reached. So we're talking August 1967. So this is the month that Brian Epstein died of quote unquote, um, an accidental overdose. Um, Nikki Byrne received a phone call from an anonymous person who said to him something along the lines of, and I'm paraphrasing, you're going to hit, and and this anonymous person um, was connected in some way, shape or form to um, these was one of these investors basically i think that's what nicky Byrne was suggesting um he was in the book in shout he's, he's suggesting that one that the anonymous phone call was somehow connected to one of these really angry business people who'd gone to the wall and what the person said to nicky Byrne on the phone was you're going to hear very soon that brian epstein is going to have an accident and <clears throat> this was in august so this is the same month that brian epstein died so it's quite possible um that 
in terms of David Jacobs, he might one of a possible suspect in his death, possible murder could have been something connected to this yeah. bungled deal. Um, yeah, it could be something with regards to that. Um, I won't go too much more into it because if anyone wants to know more, uh, get the full details of my conversation with the author of Dead Groovy and some of the other suspects, because there are plenty others, then I suggest you go and listen to that. Um, it's on my YouTube page, Conspiro TV. It's on my website, The Occult Beatles. Um, but other right. suspe- uh, one other suspect um, or suspects that, that, he, that the author puts forward are the Cray Twins. Be- right. Be- because um, David Jacobs was the Cray Twins lawyer. Um <clears throat> up until around 1967 when they were arrested and, ja- and eventually jailed for murder. Um, so the story goes, according to the author of this book, the, the Cray twins did approach um, David Jacobs and ask him if they would, if he, he would um, defend them over this murder trial and he refused. Um, so there is this suggestion that it may, may have been the, the Cray twins that had something to do with this, but yeah. Um, so that's, that's another book that's out Um this that came out earlier this year, uh, Dead Groovy. Um, another book that came out, and we've mentioned him already, is Mal, uh, Mal mm-hmm. Evans. Um, the book is called Living the Beatles Legend on the Road with the Fab, uh, with the Fab Four, the Mal Evans story, and it's um, by Kenneth Womack. I bought the book. I haven't even looked at it. I haven't read it because apparently there's going to be a volume two as well, mm. um, which is going to come mm. out in 2020. Yeah, so mm. maybe we can save that for another time and put it all together. But um, right. so I I don't know if if it's in volume one or if it's going to be left to volume two. But I know the book was written with the um, input of Mal's family, his son, and his his uh, widow. Um, so they contributed to the book. Um, okay, so it's they, it's not his di- Mal Evans diaries excerpts I, from his diaries. I, I think what the author's done, and again, I, I haven't looked into it too much because I really want to save this for another episode when volume two yeah. comes out. But from what I understand, um, what Kenneth Womack has done is he's researched Mal's history himself, looked into mm-hmm. it himself. Um, I think he might have looked at those diaries, um, the memoirs, because, mm-hmm. of course, what was originally going to happen was Mal Evans was going to release his own book based on his he was going to release his memoirs according to him it was going to come right. out in 1976 and lo and behold he died just weeks before he was going to hand it over to the publisher he got shot by police um right. now what i do know for sure because as i say i haven't read the book what I, what I do know for sure is that volume in volume two what kenneth womack says he's going to do um is he's going to put all the all the or every page from the memoirs that that Mal Evans left um, that he handed over to the publishers, all of that is going to be in the book, so you can see it for yourself, um, right. and v- various other bits of documentation that Mal had because he was a bit of a collector. He had boxes and boxes and boxes of of stuff, and apparently it's going to be in in volume two. Um, yeah. So, as you and I know, Mal was writing diaries all the way through his time with the Beatles. And after they split, he stayed with the Beatles after they split and he worked for John in in the solo years. He worked on projects with John. He'd helped John out. He helped Ringo and George, not so much Paul. Um, And yeah, so that's, what's going to happen that the, the, he, he, he wrote these, he had all these, these diaries and he he put together a, 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 a book, a, me- a memoir, and he was going to hand it over to the publishers. And then, as I say, a, a week or whenever it was before he was going to do that. Um, yeah, he died under, you might say, suspicious circumstances. Very, um, what was as it? too many around in the Beatles circle. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. So <laughs> I, I think what happened, what was it? Um, he, he, the, the official story is he was in an apartment in LA. I think it was in LA mm-hmm. and he was having yeah. an argument with his then girlfriend Um, and she called the police or a friend came over and saw the, what was going on. And he called the police and the, the the LAPD came around. I think it was, um, Mm -hmm. and he had an, he, he was waving an 
according to the story, he was waving around an air rifle in his room in the apartment, right. and the police shot him. Shot um, him, killed him, and killed him. Um, mm-hmm. And one of the detectives, apparently on the scene that day, was Charles Higby, who is said right. to have been involved in the cover up of Robert Kennedy's shooting. Right. Um, I can find. Yeah. I, can, I can actually find no proof that Charles Higby was there that day. Um, that's one of those rumors that or claims that's been put out there, but I've been uh, yeah. that, that doesn't appear to be any proof of it. Um, yeah, regard regard that, and the LAPD at that time was very corrupt. There was you know lots of issues with the um, other things that were happening and big high profile crimes that they you know embellished or covered up and whatnot. So LAPD and that was the eighties, I think, wasn't it? Late eighties that Malibans died. Uh, nineteen seventy six, January seventy six. I think it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's so, when that, very controversial. So that so because he died, the book never came out, um, and right. the memoirs got locked away in a publisher's at his publishers for decades, decades and decades and decades. Never came out um, until well until twenty twenty four. We're told, and it might even be in volume one. I don't know. As I say, I haven't looked. But there right. is this there is this belief amongst the alternative arena in the alternative arena that a lot of what was in those memoirs is not going to come out, hasn't come out. Right. And it was well, to do with secret things, secret things that the Beatles didn't want us to know about that was going on. Because as I say, he was one of the most inner of innermost insiders in the Beatles world. He saw everything right. that was going on. He was with them pretty much 24 seven he was at their beck and call he hardly ever saw his wife and children he was with right. them almost all the time um during the Beatles years when they were together um so he saw ev- just about everything that happened and there is this claim that yeah um I mean what what are the odds that just weeks or a week or so before he's about to release this tell-all book if you like he gets right. shot dead and the, the, the manuscripts get locked away for decades. Um, right. Especially with um, the amount of people wanting to cash in on the Beatles um, legacy, you know, like you would think that something like that would be immensely popular and people would want to read that and they would make a ton of money off of it. And the fact that they chose not to is also a big red flag. Like, yeah. you know, that's, of course, everybody wants to know what goes on within within the Beatles circle, you know, like the the gossip and the the fighting and, and or whatever else might be in there. Yeah. Paul dying. Who knows? Yeah, exactly. It could. <laughs> well, the PID community has picked up on it and right. said that what what was in those manuscripts in the original manuscripts, this, this memoir that was going to come out was something to do with Paul is dead. Um, right. And that's why he got taken out. That's why Mal got taken out, so that it would never it would never be released. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I want to wait and see the actual volume two and see what's in that as well, and then we can really get our teeth into it. I think because until that happens, yeah, yeah uh, I'll be interested to to have a look. What you know, yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's well, yeah. we'll lock it away in a basement for a little while and then bring <laughs> yeah. it out later. Yeah, for about 40, <laughs> 50 years, just like the the original ones by Mal. Yeah. Um, right. <laughs> another book that came out this year, it even though it's a re-release, it actually originally came out in 2018, I think it was. And again, I interviewed the author of it back in 2020. And it's you can hear it on my site, The Occult Beatles. It was a book called Behind the Wall of Illusion, The Religious, Occult and Esoteric World of the Beatles. Um, this is by Sean McLeod. And it, it, as I say, it came out in 2018, 2017, sometime like that. But it's since been re in 2023, it came out again. It's been updated and revised and reissued, if you like. Um, and basically, it's it covers a lot of the bases within the occult conspiratorial world of the Beatles. I'm looking at the, the contents page. It basically tells the occult conspiratorial story of the Beatles from their days in Liverpool and then through the Beatles years and after the split, um, for example, just to give you, it's, it's, it's done chronologically. It's got everything. It's, it covers most, you know, most of the ground that you'd expect, you know, it gets into um, Paul is dead, um, the occult, uh, the so-called occult album covers of their albums, 
Um, I'll just read you some of the chapters here, the contents. Chapter one is in the beginning, Birth of the Beatles. Um, chapter four, Nothing is Real, Esoteric Beatles. Chapter five, Christ, You Know It Ain't Easy, Bigger Than Jesus. Chapter six is about LSD and the mystic tradition. Uh, yeah, chapter seven, here's another clue for you all. Album covers, films and videos. Uh, Paul is Dead in chapter eight, Indian uh, and spiritual regeneration chapter nine um it's got a bit about john lennon's assassination mind control mk ultra yeah so it's 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 yeah it's like a compilation if you like a greatest hits of the occult beatles if you like right. um and i'm just leafing through it um this book is occult and esoteric and conspiratorial but there's a bit of sociology going on in it as well um there's a chapter or there's well there's quite a lot um focused in about Beatlemania, you know, the the you know the the popularity of the Beatles in those earlier years when when this so-called Beatlemania was going on. And what Sean does is he likens that to um Dionysus, um the ancient Greek god. He he likens Beatlemania to it being like a Dionysian rite. Um and I'm just leafing through the book here. I'm trying to find the passage there's a piece in the book here where he quotes a musicologist by the name of Ruth Padell, who writes that drink, drugs, ecstatic loss of self in illusion of every kind, especially drink and madness, violent dance, crowds, theatrical spectacle and violence. As a summary of 60s rock, Dionysus couldn't be bettered. In the 60s, popular culture made him the figurehead for male rock god. And I'm just leafing the page here. Um, um, yeah, so this is what Sean, when he's explaining Dionysus and likening it to the Beatles, um, as well as filling a void left in the socio-political environment of America during the early 60s, the Beatles also represented the changing attitude in personal affairs in the new youth culture and the release of sexual tensions and explorations that had been unhealthily suppressed during the post-war Anglo-American culture. And without doubt, as a response to changing attitudes towards women, after the war, the Beatles unleashed dormant sexual urges that manifested themselves like a Dionysian rite, in which girls seemed to behave like menads, the priestesses that oversaw the Dionysian rites. In Greek mythology, the menads, mad women or raving ones, in other words, often portrayed with supernatural associations, were inspired by Dionysus into a state of ecstatic frenzy through a combination of dancing and intoxication. Dionysus, or the god of alcohol, Bacchus, who incarnated the androgynous young male, a catalyst of wild energy, was the link between new raw sappy growth in vines or young men, crowd ecstasy, wild dance, wild nature, drink, illusion and hallucination, madness, tragic theatre and violence, maddened his worshippers, the menads who tore up live animals and expressed their suddenly abnormal consciousness in hallucinating and crazy dance with the aim of removing inhibitions and social constraints, liberating the individual to return to a natural state. The act of pulling at the Beatles, pulling their clothes or pulling their own hair, which is what used to happen back in those days, doesn't it? In the Beatle mania years, the fans would pull at their clothes and try and tear their hair. The act of pulling at the Beatles, pulling their clothes or pulling their own hair seemed to suggest the activities at such rites in which the menads would pull apart the flesh of the resurrected Dionysus. The Beatles often barely got away with their lives when they were surrounded or pursued by hormonal teenage girls. When rock and roll had unleashed, or, or I should say what rock and roll had unleashed was essentially the forces of Dionysus. And this ultimately reached its peak expression in Beatlemania when the girls would scream wildly in their concerts, pull out their hair and rip the clothes from the band if they could have. In fact, the energies were so intoxicating that it seemed to verge on being violent, maniacal, as if like in the Dionysian rite, the Menads would tear Dionysus limb from limb in order for him to rise again out of his own death. And this is the bit that got me, um, which I thought was quite original. Um, what Sean does is, you know, the Beatles in the, in those Beatlemania years when they were on stage they used to sing she loves you for example and then they would go Woo! and right. shake and shake their heads and what happened was when they shake their heads their mop top hair would 
bounce around and all the girls would go absolutely crazy. That was the part where they would scream the most when they shook their heads. Um, right. So with that in mind, this is what Sean states in his book. The trance induction central to the cult involved not only chemonosis, i.e. transformation, usually of consciousness through chemical substances or alteration of biochemical substances in the human being, but also an invocation of spirit. In the Dionysian cult, this would be through communal dancing to music, i.e. to drum and pipe, and with the bull roarer, Mm. an unusual vibrating instrument, while characteristic movements, such as the backward head flick, found in all trance-inducing cults, such as in uh, Afro-American voodoo, for example, were also part of the transforming effect. Interestingly, it was the famous head flick of the Beatles equivalent to the Elvis pelvic thrust that would have the girls screaming in frenzy. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I just Interesting. Was, yeah, it is. I thought that was quite original, uh, quite an original yeah. look on it. That is. Yeah. So that's behind. I've often the- wondered those, the, um, you know, the authors and stuff that are coming out more recently, <clears throat> if they've, you know, perused some of our, <laughs> blogs and our writings you know because a lot of a lot of things are brought up that have already been discussed you know for yeah. years now and it's just it's just interesting but that is definitely a unique take i haven't heard that one so that's great yeah that is and did you know you're in this book what you're in this book i'm in the book you're in the book you're in the <laughs> the reference section in the sources i really? kid you not I'm, I'm leaping through it now i just remembered and i'm trying to find it um you're in good company. We've got in the links page, you've got Corbett Report, um, LennonMurderTruth.com, Beatles Bible, Robert Richard uh, Hieronymus. Uh, here you are. Here you are. You're here. Here we go. Page 281 in the in the um, index section, just a few lines after PlasticMacca.com and Henry Macau. Um, <laughs> number nine blog, he's, he's referencing one of your articles, uh, the number nine blog.wordpress.com, 2016, uh 20th of the 6th i've opened up the doors oh wow nice yeah so there we go there you go you didn't know that did you i'm practically famous well hey (laughs) yeah (laughs) so that's behind the wall of illusion the religious occult and esoteric world of the beatles out again uh in 2023 by sean mcleod also out um uh this year um it came out at a film festival in 2022 but it actually came out on general well almost general release kind of limited but more general than just a film festival was um the documentary by may pang um, which is called the lost weekend a love story um have you seen this i haven't seen it yet i um um, i I follow may pang on various social media and so i've read um she's you know uh released a lot of like excerpts and stuff like that and has talked about it and all that good stuff but i have not actually read the whole yeah. entirety of it yeah um i've seen it um it's really difficult to find and to get hold of in the uk in america mm. i think it's available on amazon i think you can get it on dvd and blu-ray as well uh, yeah. and various other stream streaming sites but in the uk um it's only available as as we speak now in december 2023 it's only available via a, a documentary um website called iconfilmchannel.uk and you have mm. to pay four pounds a month or a week or whatever it is so i just paid the four pounds for one week watched it and then unsubscribed um <laughs> as you do um right do you know what i don't think if you watched it i think you'd be entertained by it i was entertained by it but there's not actually anything in it um that you that's will think new. that's new. She's just going yeah. over a lot of the stuff that she's already written about in books in her previous two books, I think it was, and in, said right. in interviews. And yeah, she, she, yeah, I mean, we, we've talked a, a bit about it on past editions, a magical mystery talk. She talks about when um, the, the hypnotist thing, right. rem- remember that. Because, of course, anyone who doesn't know who May Pang is, she was John's girlfriend, basically. It was one of those weird things where John and Yoko had split up in 1973. And Yoko, um, one of these weird Yokoist type 
bits of behavior you might call Mm -hmm. it mind control a handler maybe maybe it's her being a handler to john um suggested to their secretary may pang that maybe she would like to john's leaving the nest is leaving yoko maybe it's good if she if may went with him um yeah which is just what it's just anyway so she does may does go along with john um even though in the documentary she claims that she didn't want to initially but John it, charmed his way into her sort of charmed his way into her affections and, right. and she, she went with him. Um, and yeah, and they were together for about 18 months and, and, and she clay and she talks about the hypnotist um, event in, in, in the documentary where she claims that John eventually went back to Yoko one day when he got a phone call uh, from, from Yoko. And she said to him, that she'd found a hypnotist who'd be able to stop him from smoking. Um, and May says in the documentary, and as she's done in previous interviews, she she was un- she was uneasy about this. She she felt that there was something not quite right about this. And she she yeah, she right. said to John, please don't do this, please don't go. Um, but John went. He went to the Dakota, the apartment where Yoko was living. Um, and he was there for the whole weekend. He didn't come home. Um, and then when she saw him again, it was on the Monday and they had a dentist appointment that they'd arranged for the two of them, May and John. And she went to the dentist appointment as arranged and she saw John there and she says he was completely different. It wasn't the same person that had left on the Friday for the weekend. He was just like a, almost like a robot kind of thing. And, yeah, mm-hmm. and he left her. He went back to Yoko from that point on. So she does talk about that um yeah just one it's one thing that just made me feel uneasy um she because she how she initially got to know john and yoko and worked for them was she actually started she actually worked before she worked for john and yoko she worked for the beatles business manager in the late 60s early 70s uh, alan klein that's who mm-hmm. she initially had worked for and that's how she met john and yoko um and i just i don't know it just she says at the beginning uh, of the documentary i can't remember I, she says that she she was at school she left school i can't remember the exact details i won't be getting some of this one but she says she says yeah she just wanted to leave home and go to new york and make her fortune or do something exciting with her life so she went to new york and she wanted a job and she thought yeah i, I want to get into the record industry or something like this i might be getting a lot of this wrong not quite exact but the roundabout explanation is that she said to herself oh yeah oh there's a job going oh i know i'll go to apple records and see if they've got any jobs going so she goes into this office in new york they ask her if she's good at typing she says she is but she's lying she says in the documentary she wasn't good at typing and she got the job um is i mean maybe things were different back then in the early 70s late 60s early 70s but i don't know it just Really? Was it that easy? Oh, I just decide that I want to go and work at you know, the Beatles record company and I just walk right. in and they just say, yeah, of course, you can start tomorrow. How about $100,000 a year? Or, do you know what I mean? It just sounds a little right. bit bit Hollywood. Perfect. Mm-hmm. Like a Hollywood yeah. movie kind of. I don't know. Right. I get, and also, um, you know, unfortunately, women at that time, it, it wasn't quite so easy to get a job as a woman, especially a young woman you know, that fresh out of college or whatnot. You know, I think she was yeah. in her early 20s, if not 19. Yeah, I think and, she might, uh, might have been in her late teens, yeah. Yeah, and just marched right in there and got a job. That's That does seem a bit far-fetched. Yeah. So, and lying about, you know, the skills that she had. And, yeah, and then ended up becoming, a you know, a close associate to Yoko. That's kind of weird. Yeah, so. and, and, and lying going for a job and lying when the boss is alan klein who was a notorious figure who was very famous for sacking people for firing people for keeping costs down would he have stood for this girl being there who actually lied about her job i don't know i just i don't know it's just a little side of me when i heard her say that in the documentary just made me feel a little bit "Mm, not sure about this this sounds a little bit too easy you know right just walk into a record company and just get a job like that if that was the case everyone would be would have done it everyone would be doing it just sounds sure. 
I don't know. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But um, yeah, so that that's out this year. That um, documentary also out this year. Uh, it came out in October twentieth, twenty twenty three. Was um, Danny Harrison's new album. I think it's his second solo album. He's also released um, material with a band called the New Number Two. They released mm-hmm. some albums in the two thousands and two thousand and tens, some singles as well and EPs. Um, but he he had a new he released a new album this year called Inner Standing, and I've picked some some of the lyrics out from about three of the tracks because they do have some relevance. I think to they're, they're very magical mystery talkish. Um, mm. One of the songs is called New Religion, and he's in. in I, I won't give you all the lyrics. I've just picked out the bits that are m- m- more relevant to us. Um, New Religion. He sings, "Scream me the news." Sounds like some bullshit. Don't speak too soon. You'll go and say something stupid. Reds and the blues pretending they're different when they are all in cahoots and it's just one crooked system. And I'm thinking mm-hmm. when he sings Reds and the Blues, he's probably talking about politics, party mm-hmm. politics, especially in the UK and Britain. You've got the right side of politics of the Blues, the Tories, the Conservatives. And on the left, you've got Labour, who are the Reds. The, the, right. So, that's the same here. Yeah. So I think he's yeah. probably that's what he's probably on about there. It's just it doesn't matter who you vote for. It's all the same. Kind all of the thing. same. All the same. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't eat your food. We're sick of the water. Stop this abuse, plastic and poison. Your head's in the noose, but you're still chasing the farmer. So that's farmer as in pharmaceutical, P-H-A-R-M-A. Hmm. Oh, please deliver me, Lord, from the megatech and the coroner. I ain't going to dance for a new religion. Don't suffer fools, my brothers and sisters. There's no time to lose. Society left us. Love is the tool. Raise the vibration. Because when you live in the love, it's called a civilization. So that's Hmm. one song. Um, Another song is Right Side of History. And basically that song is just repeating the same, pretty much the same lines over and over again. Um, I'm on the right train. Don't take no shame. Don't cast no blame. I am love. Um, Don't preach hate. I am love. Um, and it's pretty much just repeating that. And then it's like a mantra, like a mantra kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm. it's quite a modern sounding, you know, it's quite electronica, um, mm-hmm. electronic. It's not like a band. It's, it, it's not, it doesn't sound like a band album with, you know, guitars, drums and all of that. It's a very electronic, um, album. Um, very, very contemporary sounding. Uh, and finally, just one more, um, song, the dancing tree. Um, I'll just pick out some of the lyrics from this. Welcome to the underworld. Thoughts are taken and mind controlled. Eyes are still dirty from all you saw because you doom scrolled till your thumbs were raw. Pretending all the way they saved the place while addicted to the kickback farmer pay. Again, pharmaceutical. Waiting for the cult to rue the day. Just waiting for the cult to rue the day. Something Mm. in the way their motives stray. Nothing like an island escapade. Waiting for the cult to rue the day. Someone better take their toys away. Justice isn't working. All the pigs they're running. You fucking nuisance. Think you're above us. You're bloody lucky. You roll with body doubles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) To emancipate the sovereigns, (laughs) mass formation became psychotic between the politicians, doctors and the prophet. I know the difference. It's worth a mention. Our situation is going to need attention for the rejection of a system that's moronic to help the people that are starving for some loving all the horrors that you've faced just for nothing. So, yeah, that's just three sets of lyrics there from from the album. Um, And that particular that particular. Yeah. Any thoughts on those lyrics? Uh, Yeah, uh, they're all kind of interesting, just depending on, um, you know, what side of the Beatles that you uh side yeah. on but yeah the the body doubles part and the <laughs> yeah yeah the mind control and all of that we've had a lot of mind control discussion in this episode it seems like and hypnotism <laughs> and, yeah isn't that yeah isn't that every episode I don't know <laughs> well pretty much but yeah but especially this one yeah yeah uh, huh yeah and 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 yeah, the way he's singing that particular song, it's like he's singing it to somebody personally. It's not like he's doing it like the when he says you in the lyrics. It's not like the the general you, like all of us. It's like he's right. saying it to somebody in particular. So very interesting. Maybe, again, I'm reaching, but he's it's like he's speaking to someone. And here is in this song, he's speaking. He's 
it's like he's speaking to someone and he's talking to this someone about body doubles. So that right. makes it very personal, something within the Beatles world, if you like, yeah, something personal yeah. to him. I don't know. I'm, again, I'm just reaching, but yeah, I just thought yeah. it was weird that he put you roll with body doubles in there. Just out of nowhere, it seems that that comes, comes into the lyrics. Um, right. And this song features at the beginning of it, it's got a sample from the TV show, the prisoner, um, which was a popular TV show. Um, it was released in the States. It came out in the sixties, mm -hmm. um, 19, I think it was released in the UK either in 1966 or 1967. It was a mini series. It's what you would call these days, a mini series definitely came out in the States as well. And it's about, it's, it's very allegorical on the face of it. It's quite surreal. Oh, it's very surreal, actually. On the face of it, if you look at it from the, on the, it's like a, it's like an onion. It's got different layers to it. Um, mm -hmm. And on the on the face of it, it's basically a spy thriller. It's about this man, an ex um, secret intelligence agent who resigns, and most of the opening titles of the show over the seventeen episodes, most of the episodes open the opening titles have this protagonist, this man who gets to be known as the prisoner. He's in London. He's an ex, soon to be ex secret service agent. You see him driving to the, his HQ and throwing down a letter of resignation. Then he drives out of the HQ. You see him go back to his house and the music's playing, the theme music's playing. You don't hear him talk. And he's, he's, he, he's got some luggage and, and on top of the luggage, um, as he's loading the, 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 the suit, uh, the the luggage bag with his clothes on the top is a photograph of a uh, tropical island. So obviously, the insinuation there is that he's resigned from the secret service and he's going to go and to a uh, escape to a sunny part of the world and get away from it all. And as he's packing, this gas comes through the door, um, through the keyhole of his front door. Uh, it's like sleeping gas, and it makes him sleep, makes him collapse. And he wakes up and he looks out the window and he's somewhere completely different. He's not in London anymore. He's not in his house in London. He's in the village. Um, mm. And this is actually a real village. It's called Port Mirian. It's in Wales. Um, it's a seaside coastal. It's a coastal village and it's actually a, re a real village. It's called Port Mirian. But in the program, it's called the village. And mm -hmm. everybody who lives in this village are basically prisoners. Um, they're all secret service people that have been taken yeah. there because they've been found to have been um, traitors, if you like, working for the quote unquote other side. Um, and throughout the whole series, the the controllers of this village are trying to trying to find out why this protagonist, who's played by the actor Patrick McGowan, I think he actually he directed many of the episodes as well. He wrote a lot of it and I think he might've produced it as well, but don't hold me to that. But yeah, he's the protagonist in this. Um, and they're trying to find out why he resigned, but he won't tell them. Um, and he's known as number six. Everyone on that, on that, in that village that isn't known by their name. They're, they're known by numbers. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and in the opening sequences, you always hear Patrick McGowan say, I am not a number. I am a free man. Um, so th he's he's basically fighting against this place where he is. And it's, as, as I say, it's very allegorical. Um, it's very anti, it seems to be anti New World Order, anti Big Brother, mm. certainly, because everybody, it, even the, the village, everyone who lives in this village, when you look at the village, it, it it's like, it's like paradise. Um, mm -hmm. They're all prisoners, but there's no prison bars. You know, it's everybody, you know, you see people going on the beach and have some bathing or going for a coffee or going to the theatre or to a dance or just walking around in the sunshine amongst the beautiful scenery. Because it's a very um, it's a very um, unique place, Port Mirian, mm -hmm. where this village is set. Um, it was built by, by an architect uh, in the 1920s, a guy by the name of Sir Bertram Clough Williams Ellis. So it looks beautiful and everything, but in every home, there, there's just there's cameras everywhere. It's there's, there's CCTV cameras everywhere. And don't forget this. Yeah. This was made in 1966, 67. This series. Um, so wherever you go, even in your home, there are CCTV cameras watching you, and there are microphones picking up what you're saying, and everything is being monitored. But it's a bit like real life, where 
people are going about their daily life and most of the people the vast majority of these people that are living on this in this village are are acquiescing to this their brain they're almost like sheep they're not questioning mm. the fact that they're being watched that they're being surveilled there are very few people in that village who are questioning it and one of those is number 6 Patrick McGowan, yes. the protagonist in the story, he's constantly fighting against this system. And it's like real life. You know, it, w- you could say that we live in that kind of uh, existence as well. We go about our <laughs> daily lives. We don't have prison bars, but we're prisoners. You know, we can go to the movie theatre. We can go to a cinema. We can go have a meal, go and have fun, go on the beach and have fun. But if you look beyond that outer casing um, and behind it, we're we're all basically sheep we you know we all take part in elections and fall for all the official narratives and we just follow blindly um so we're all prisoners so in that sense i think that's what patrick mcgoon was trying to say is that yeah these people live in a a fantasy of this beautiful village but they're prisoners but without the bars um and the person that runs the village is the manager of the village is number two and every week in the every episode there's a new number two and this mm. is where Danny got the name for his band, the new number two, um, from this from this figure, this person who, mm. it, and they're voted in democratically. But um, yeah, again, like real life, you you vote democratically for this number two, right? But nothing changes; you're still a prisoner. And right. in a, each episode, we hear number six ask, "Who is number one?" So again, you could say, like real life, we have. A number two, you could say the prime ministers, the presidents, but above that, there is a number one, and we don't know who it is. I don't because, know who it is. Yeah, and he he doesn't find out until the last episode who number one actually is. Um, so yeah, again, you could say it's like the grand conspiracy. Who's that? We've got the number twos, the presidents, the prime ministers, but there's a tip to the pyramid, and we don't see who's on the tip of that pyramid. Um, right. Now, as I say, uh, Danny has uh, um, formed a band called The New Number Two, and apparently the Beatles were huge fans of The Prisoner as well. Um, And according to Danny, he reportedly claimed um, some time back that before the Beatles actually got down to filming Magical Mystery Tour in 1967, they'd actually approached Patrick McGowan uh, about writing and directing for them a movie which would be like a prisoner type film um that's what danny has claimed and actually this has been confirmed Mm. in some way by ringo who also said in an interview that the beatles were fans of of the prisoner and they actually approached mcgoo and and george has said it too he said that the beatles did indeed invite patrick to come and see them with a view to Mm -hmm. him writing something for them uh, given that they liked the prisoner very much but of course as is the case with a lot of things in the beatles world uh it never actually happened. But you do get to hear All You Need Is Love in the last episode of The Prisoner, which is quite a rarity <laughs> in those days, because I might be wrong, but I, I seem to recall that um, I've, I'm under the understanding that the Beatles, especially in the 60s, 70s and 80s and 90s, were very picky about what they allowed, about their songs being allowed to right. be used they didn't like them being used in tv commercials that's certainly not the case anymore because they now are but they didn't like them being used without their permission in tv programs and but they allowed all you need is love to be um um played um in that um show so it kind of shows you how big they were into it and apparently george right. in 1993 when he celebrated his 50th birthday he celebrated it in port Mirian in this actual village where the prisoner oh, wow. was set. Um, and Brian Epstein used to go there. I mean, it goes back even further. Pre prisoner days, Brian Epstein used to go to Port Mirian um, with his, on family holidays. So by family holidays, I'm, I'm suspect, I suspect that means with his parents right. and his, and his brother. Um, and yeah, he was, he actually holidayed there right up until 1966, 67, um, that you can actually find photographs of him um, with with George Martin in Port Mirian. Um, mm. And he actually had a cottage there. Yeah, he had his own cottage there as well. Uh, such, mm. so, you know, that's how regular he was. Um, 
And yeah, as I say, the new number two was the name of Danny's band. And he was asked why he named it the new number two. I've got a quote here and in, from an interview. He says, I was looking for a name for a band that was, you know, faceless, just as a way of people being able to see the work that we were doing for what it was before they realized that there was any sort of attachment to any Beatles stigma or whatever you want to call it. And in another interview, mm. he said, who wants to be number one? You don't want to be the world's best vet because then you don't care about the dogs anymore because you're the best. The second guy mm. always seems to do better. And two is an interesting number because it's dualistic. Um, yeah. So mm. that's what he said about it. But, you know, there is something that makes me feel a little bit uneasy about Danny. Um, Cause when I was looking into this, I, I realized I was looking into his discography and everything and apparently he he composed and recorded the soundtrack um, for the 2019 documentary miniseries Inside Bill's Brain, Decoding Bill Gates. Um, mm. And I went through the pain of actually watching this <laughs> <laughs> in preparation for Magical Mystery Talk episode number nine, number nine. Um, because I was just I was just thinking, what why is Danny doing this? Maybe maybe the it, it's a three-part documentary, it's 40 five minutes each um each episode and i thought well maybe maybe it's it's protesting against bill gates uh no it's not no it's, it, it's celebrating bill gates it's oh. it explains what a great philanthropist he is the good he's done with um the polio vaccine in the so-called third world how he's helped mm. bring clean water clean sanitation to the so-called third world how he's helped to eradicate or go somewhere to eradicating diarrhea in the third world, so-called third world. It talks about yeah. what a genius, hardworking man he is, how his genius brought us Microsoft, blah, 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 and on and on and on. So, yeah, it's completely celebratory. Um, interestingly, it came out in 2019. So this would have been right before the lockdowns. Yeah, right before he went down. Right before he went down, right before everybody or lots more people, even within the mainstream, if you like, started to see, you know, when the arm spears began to be introduced mm -hmm. and there's Bill at the front of the, the queue, as it were, talking about it. Yeah, that's when his profile began to dip a lot, I would right. probably say. So, yeah, so it's interesting that that this documentary comes out just before all that happens. It's kind of like building up his image just before, you know, sort of doing some some kind of damage limitation, if you like. Um, right. And I, I do wonder, just, just to be fair to Danny, whether he went into this documentary thinking that Bill was this great philanthropist. And it could be that he woke up to it after the, after the you know, when, when the lockdowns came in. Maybe he did his own research. And maybe that's why in the song New Religion, he's singing about, farmer farmer mm -hmm. yeah a mega tech interesting i don't know it's 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 quite possible um i don't know but um with regards to bill gates um <laughs> it's it was rumored this year that um bill gates's daughter phoebe was actually dating paul mccartney's grandson arthur donald who's um paul mccartney's um it's mary mccartney's son so paul's daughter oh wow um yeah yeah interesting i haven't been keeping able the, to confirm it um yeah keeping it, the bloodlines together huh yeah exactly um <laughs> this is what i just it gets it actually gets worse than that because i looked at this and started to dig a little bit um to be fair i i, I, I where i first read about this on the mail online again the mail online um it, it reported that paul mccartney's grandson yeah is is arthur donald is was dating phoebe gates who's one of Bill and Melinda Gates's daughters. Um, and it, what the Mail Online did was it posted up a picture. I think it's from Phoebe's Instagram page. It might, it might be a Twitter page. And it's a picture of her standing on a balcony in Paris. So it said, quite close next to Arthur. They're not kissing or caressing each other or hugging each other, but they're standing closely to each other. Um, but yeah, that's about as far as it's got, really. I mean, I've... I've looked on her social media pages. I've looked at the actual photograph, at the text next to it to see if she's hinting at, or stating in any way, shape or form, if this is a relationship, if you know what I mean. And no, there's, I, I've been actually been able to find nothing 
to um confirm that actually um <laughs> but having said that <laughs> um she is close to the mccartneys um as i say i did a little bit of digging apparently she's 21 years old she's a student at stanford university and she's been described also as a quote unquote social media sensation um she's got something like over 400,000 followers on instagram and this is at the time I'm recording this, I looked back a couple of weeks and at the time I looked back, um, she had about 405,000 followers on Instagram and about wow. 240,000 on TikTok. Um, I don't know about Twitter, but yeah, I, I did a little bit of digging into her to find out some more. Um, and yeah, aside from Paul McCartney's grandson, allegedly, um, Phoebe's actually known Paul McCartney's other daughter, Stella, for a long time. Um, and she was actually Phoebe was actually in, um, introduced to Stella through Melinda Gates because Melinda oh, wow. Gates and Stella McCartney are friends and have been for years. Um, yeah, I've got a quote here from October 19, uh, from October 2022. Um, Phoebe said that Stella and Phoebe's mum are and I'm quoting Phoebe here from the article are actually good friends. Um, even when I was little, Stella would send me stuff and little notes and I'd be so excited. I've been asking my mom forever and ever if I could meet with her. So, yeah, according to this article, Phoebe and Stella got together in the summer of 2022 in London and they instantly hit it off, to quote Phoebe. And since then, uh, so the article goes on, the two have remained close, um, mainly via text, texts and also uh, Stella invited Phoebe along to one of the annual uh, Paris fashion weeks because of course Stella is a, a clothes designer she's got her own fashion brand um, yeah and according to the Mail Online when they were honing in on her being a quote-unquote social media sensation that's Phoebe um, apparently one of the questions that one of her many followers asked Phoebe was what's the downside um, they asked Phoebe what was the downside of being this quote-unquote social media sensation and Phoebe replied that one of the downsides was having to put up with, and I quote, the misconceptions and conspiracy theories about my family. Yeah, it would appear, I might be wrong, as I say, I've looked a little bit into Phoebe, and it would appear that she is the next generation carrying on the, the Gates agenda. Um, because if you look at her social media pages, yeah, sure, there's a lot going on there. Um yeah, you know, a 21 year old young woman who's at university. Sure. There's lots of social media posts of her on there, partying with her friends, socializing friends, her and her friends at university, you know, regular stuff. But in amongst all of that, um, she's pushing quite proactively for what one who is of a cynical disposition <laughs> might deem to be the Gates agenda. Uh, she talks mm. a lot. If you look at her social media pages, uh, video posts and other such stuff, she talks a lot, for instance, about a woman's right to have an abortion uh, if they mm. want to, if they so choose, uh, especially with regards to uh, the US, where, if I'm not mistaken, uh, a number of US states in 2022 made abortion illegal after right. the Supreme Court last year overturned a legal ruling that was passed in 1973, which made abortion elite uh, a abortion legal across all of the us that's been since reversed in uh, right. since then in 2022 so i'm not i'm not having i'm not I, i'm not saying no i i don't agree i personally don't agree with abortion or a woman's right to her, her own body i'm not saying that i'm just saying that here we have a member of the gates family who have this notorious um history for quote unquote population control and family planning here we have a daughter of the of bill gates of the of the creators of the bill and melinda gates foundation um talking about family planning um to quote her here she says i'm working on ways to support the fight for women's reproductive rights i'm thinking about how i can use my platform and voice to support the activists fighting back to reclaim our reproductive rights this time for good I'm aware that my family name brings a platform and I'm thinking about how I might use this to spotlight the awesome activists doing incredible work day in, day out. As I say, I'm not disputing her 
championing women's rights. It's just that, it, you know, what what side of the fence is she coming from this? You know, from you know, um, you know, is is she is she genuine? Does she genuinely care, or is she is she prime? Is she being primed up to be the next generation? You know, of the Bill Gates agenda of right you know population control or as others might say to push the eugenics agenda um i'll just point out at this stage that phoebe at stanford university is majoring in human biology um mm. i don't know if that's something that's worth mentioning and if you look in a on her posts a lot of the posts where she's bringing up these issues she tags the posts with the words planned parenthood Oh. And yeah, anyone who's looked into the background of her dad, Bill Gates, will be aware of Planned Parenthood. Of course, it's a, a non-profit organization. Bill's father was ahead of it back in the day, and he encouraged mm -hmm. Bill, his son, to be active in it as well. And of course, it was founded back in the 1940s by a woman by the name of Margaret Sanger, uh, who was a supporter of eugenics, in other words, of population control. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so we, we we have that going on um you know um, yeah. she's also she's also active in an event called goalkeepers uh, which is an event which is organized by the bill and melinda gates foundation um she appeared at an event in new york i think it was this year which is called goalkeepers um and it was this live event where people came to talk um live speakers uh, according to the official website of goalkeepers and this and if if i read this to you you're going to notice all of you know you'll probably notice a lot of the key nwo words in there uh in 2015 world leaders agreed to 17 global goals for sustainable development to achieve a better world by 2030 started by the bill and melinda gates foundation goalkeepers is a catalyst for action toward these goals bringing together leaders from around the world to make progress toward ending poverty and fighting inequality goalkeepers is dedicated to accelerating progress toward the global goals using powerful stories data and partnerships to highlight progress achieved and bring together a diverse range of leaders to address the world's major challenges um yeah so yeah. Uh, in 2015, it goes on, member states of the United Nations agreed upon 17 global goals to create a more sustainable future for all. All these keywords. Uh, the goalkeepers community is working toward ending extreme poverty and hunger and improving healthy living, education, gender equality, access to clean water and sanitation. Phoebe has also appeared at a global citizen event. I won't go too much into that. We mentioned that. I think it was in episode eight of magical mystery talk um julian lennon um did a stand up for ukraine uh campaign event uh, he, he sang imagine his dad's song imagine for the stand up for ukraine um event that took place last year to raise money for ukraine um and it was supported by uh, eu president ursula von der Leyen and all the prime ministers and presidents across the world or most of them uh, and yeah and julian lennon sang imagine to tie into that so that was this campaign stand up for ukraine that was tied into yeah. global citizen um and yeah so here we have phoebe appearing at a global citizen live event um there's footage of her on stage um talking at that um yes yeah, so if you want to know more information about global citizen uh you can go take a look at um, or take a listen to episode eight um incidentally arthur Paul McCartney's grandson. I, I I I looked online. Apparently, he's a climate investor. Um, mm. I, I I don't actually. I didn't actually know what a climate investor was. Um, <laughs> I've got no idea what a climate investor is or was. I looked on Google just to get like a, a basic explanation of it. Uh, apparently, he went to Yale University as well. Um, but yeah, apparently, he's a climate investor. Um, and yeah, and Phoebe um, is attached to the whole climate change agenda in other ways, aside from the goalkeepers event that her parents organize. Um, she's also about to launch what's called fire or fear. It's spelled P H I A. It probably is fear. Um, <laughs> knowing the way yeah. these people's brains work. Um, it's a so-called fashion platform. It's a fashion platform um, between her and fellow Stanford student friend, Sophia Kiani. So Fia, P-H-I-A, it's probably an amalgamation of both their names. Um, uh. And Sophia is an advisor for the UN 
um, which is a bit weird because she's a university student, a university student advising the UN, really? Oh, God. <laughs> um, and she's also the founder of something called Climate Cardinals, um, which is, according to its website, an international youth-led nonprofit working to make the climate movement more accessible to those who don't speak English. We aim to educate and empower a diverse coalition of people to tackle the climate crisis. We have over 10,000 volunteers who are translating and sourcing climate information into over 100 different languages with partners like the United Nations. Um, yeah, and apparently this fear or fire, um, I'm going to call it fear, um, has um, actually gone done something in conjunction with Stella McCartney. So uh, so this would yeah. be Phoebe and Sophia Chiani. Um, they, they teamed up with Stella McCartney for a fashion brand recently. Um, Phoebe has said of Stella, I felt very connected to her. I feel like because she's been able to use the platform she had because of who her dad is. And then she took that. And instead of being like, oh, people define me by this, she took it and she was like, OK, I have this immense privilege. Now I'm going to use it to leverage something. And what she chose to leverage is to launch a brand that is completely sustainable because, uh, of course, Stella makes vegan friendly clothes and accessories so i think we are really deeply connected because that's a lot of what i think about okay i'm my parents daughter that gives me immense privilege but it's not what i'm defined by i want to have my own identity i want to be my own person i want to branch away from that but how do i do that in a way where i can yield some sort of change um, hmm. yeah maybe get a minimum wage job at the local 7-eleven or McDonald's yeah. or something. Yeah. You can start yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, climate investor. I've got it up on Google now. I've managed to type it in. My my computer was in front of me, went a bit sort of slow. All right. What is a climate investor? This is according to Google. Uh no, it's according to a website by the name of carboncollective.co. Uh climate investments refer to the allocation of financial resources towards projects, initiatives, and technologies that aim to mitigate the impacts of climate change. There we go again, and promote the transition to a low carbon, sustainable economy. These investments can be made by individuals, businesses, and governments. So that's the line of work that Arthur um Donald. Um, Paul McCartney's grandson is into apparently if if the facts are true that I, I found online so it's like they're all pushing this agenda that the, the McCartney's are, are going with this climate thing because uh, of course yeah. we've got Stella as well um, earlier um, this year I think Mark, Mark mentioned it in the intro uh, she got a, a royal honour earlier this year in 2023 she got a, a CBE from King Charles III uh, in other words, what's known as the command of the order of the British Empire. And she was given this for, uh, uh, we're told, and I quote, her services to fashion and sustainability. Um, and she'd actually been awarded an OBE in 2013, which is the order of the British Empire. Um, presumably, she got that for the same kind of thing, really. So she, basically, she's been promoted. She's been given a higher honour. Um I do remember we have spoken about Stella before and her um, involvement with various climate change agendas um, because she's like championing all of that kind of thing. She's appeared at the COP, a couple of COP events, which, of course, stands for United Nations Climate Change Conference. She appeared at COP26, which took place in Scotland in 2021. She appeared at the G7 summit to talk about um, the fashion industry and how it can help um, with regards to so-called climate change. And she also appeared at COP28, which took place in um, December 2023, um, which took place in Abu Dhabi, I think it was. She was there as well. Um, and we have talked about her at length in episode six and episode eight. I did some back checking and we talked about her at length about you know her involvement in COP, the COP26 and also G7. Um, and we also mentioned in the last episode her she was invited as a guest to Buckingham Palace uh, in November mm -hmm. 22. She was invited by King Charles, who just then not that long been crowned king. Um, right. That still sounds so strange to me. It does. I keep king wanting Charles. to say Prince Charles, but yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. We mentioned that she'd been invited to a, a reception at Buckingham Palace, um, and that was on the eve of COP27. She didn't go to COP27, but she did go to this reception. And I, was, and I think we mentioned in that previous episode that also there, was um, also attending it was uh, John Kerry, uh, who is apparently the US climate envoy. 
uh, John Kerry. And as Mark pointed out in that episode, he's also a, a member of the secret society Skull and Bones. Uh, also at that reception was um, the chief executive of AstraZeneca. Um, really nice people. Mm-hmm. And current British Prime Minister <laughs> Rishi Sunak as well. And it's at that reception that apparently she learned that her children, Stella's children and Rishi Sunak's children, go to the same school or something. Um, mm. So they got very cosy. They got they cozied up um, talking about that. Um, something I didn't mention in episode eight was when I read the reports about her going to this reception, there was very little said in the reports that I read about what they talked about. But what was inferred, but not spelled out in words, was that there was some kind of flirtation going on between Charles mm. and Stella. Um, oh, because. Yeah, it was, it was really weird. They didn't the, the, like the press, the, the, the news reports didn't say it in words, as I say, it was, but it left the reader. It certainly left me with the impression that what they were trying to say was that Charles and Stella were kind of, yeah, flirting, um, that there was a little bit of a thing going on, like an energy kind of thing. I don't know. Cause, Interesting. Because um, apparently when she walked into the room, apparently the protocol of what you're supposed to do, you're supposed to bow when you see the king or queen, you're supposed to bow, I think, and shake their hand. And if you're a woman, you curtsy and you lightly shake their hand or something. But what he did, what Charles did when she walked into the room is he went for her and kissed her on the cheeks. Mm. Um, At which point she giggled and she said, and I quote, your majesty, I don't know what to do anymore. I think I'm supposed to do this now. And then she curtsied and he laughed. Um, And, (laughs) Yeah, it was like the story was trying to, like the news reports that I've read about that. It was like they were trying to um, infer that, you know, some, oh, something, across, going on. something going on or something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, really. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so yeah, we've talked at length about Stella at these G7, that G7 and the, the previous COP that she was at, at COP26 at great length, in great length in episode eight and six. Um, and one of the things that she talked a lot about, it was almost like a mantra when she appeared at G7, she went, basically she went to the G7 summit to represent the climate change agenda from the fashion industry's point of view. Um, and as I, I think I said in one of the episodes or maybe both, well, who, who in the fashion industry actually put their hands up and says, yeah, we want Stella to represent us with regards to the climate change agenda. So it's not like anyone, I don't think anyone actually voted for her to go and do this. But there, there, there is this continuing mantra that she's kept saying over and over again at G7 and COP26. And she's been saying it at COP28 as well. Two things. And it's like a mantra. One of those is that she keeps saying that the fashion industry is one of the most polluting industries in the world. She keeps saying that in every interview that she's done at these events or where she's interviewed, where she's appeared on stage at these events in front of the delegates, those there. She keeps saying this over and over again. And the other thing that she keeps saying is that that she wants the fashion industry to be policed, to have um, um, laws placed on it, guidelines, um, policies, which if you're a business person, you might think, oh, you might think, no, a business person might think, no, a business person might not want that because it's going to stifle their business, destroy their business. Um, Yeah, we discussed this in a previous couple of in in episode eight maybe episode six as well um now she was at cop 28 she had an exhibition there and according to her website and i quote we are hosting a groundbreaking exhibition at cop 28 platforming the future of material innovation showcasing over 15 next generation pioneers alongside breakthroughs in regenerative agriculture bio and plant-based alternatives to plastic, animal leather and fur, and traditional fibres. Among the innovations being platformed at COP28 are a grape-based alternative using the harvest byproduct from the Champagne Maison um, historic vineyard in Reims, France. We have also collaborated with Protein Evolution, uh, which I think is a, I think it's described as a U.S. US's first biological recycling company. So she's collaborated with Protein Revolution on the world's first garment crafted from biologically recycled, infinitely recycled polyester made using their BioPure technology. Uh, she also uh, she's also said um, in an interview while she was at 
COP28 that she's exhibiting a leather-free alternative called Miriam, I think it's called. It's like rubber-based material um, and knitwear made out <laughs> knitwear made out of algae, algae. Um, mushrooms, so, right? Yeah, mushrooms. We've talked yeah. about that in the past as well. So, yeah. you know, on the face of it, you know, it's, it all sounds great. You know, I, I, I personally don't have an issue with the, you know, of course I don't. You know, I, I, I love the planet I live on. I don't want it to be harmed and raped, and you know, um, yeah. there's, yeah. there's nothing inherently wrong with that. Um, there, there's a piece, there's a, there's an interview that she gave where she actually goes on to say with regards to materials that are used, animal materials and raw materials that have been wasted to make clothes and accessories. She says, people need to know that over a billion animals are killed every year. Um, um, and the chemicals used to tan leathers can be cancerous to the people that are having to work with them. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with that, you know, but like I said, we've said in previous episodes is she doing this because she's genuinely she genuinely cares or does she genuinely care and she's being used by these so-called elites or is she mm -hmm. actually following a malevolent climate change nwo if you like agenda um right <clears throat> and and with regards to um you know especially with you know when she where she says she wants the fashion industry to be policed you know that's fine for her she's a, she's you know if if she wants her industry if she if she goes bankrupt for example that that's no big big deal to her in a way uh, you could say you could argue because she's right. her, her dad's a billionaire a billionaire pop right. star so but if you're a, if you're a, if you if you're lower down the ladder as it were and you rely on your fashion business your design company your shop your high street shop your store whatever to bring the bread and butter to the table these restrictions these legis this legislation might actually ruin you um, and, right. and, and and take you out. I mean, I am aware that she has said in previous interviews, and she said it in this interview as well, that what it, it, uh, she said it in interviews at COP28, that what she's looking for, she wants legislation and, and restrictions put on the fashion industry. But at the same time, she wants, she doesn't want the fashion industry to be damaged. She wants there to be um, incentives, but with, uh, she wants incentives, basically. She wants rather but, than penalties rather than penalties um right. so yeah so the thing is there's something quite interesting that she said um she kept going on and on about she kept i've listened to some of the interviews and read some of the interviews that she made at cop 28 and yeah she does keep going on and on about again she keeps saying the fashion industry is one of the most harmful in the world we need to be policed she keeps saying it on and on and on but there was something that stuck out at me she said she was talking to Bloomberg TV and she was talking about her aims to have the fashion industry policed and regulated. And she said that she does this in part by infiltrating. She said, I think to infiltrate from within is kind of what I do. It's what my relationship with the fashion industry is to show there is another way. So, yeah, we're working hard at trying to make change. I'm calling out my own industry. Um yeah, that's that's kind of like yeah, infiltrate. That's an interesting, interesting word. Um, right. Yeah, interesting choice of words. So yeah, so here we have Stella pushing the climate change ag agenda. We've got um, Paul McCartney's grandson, a climate investor, so called. So it's reported. And whilst all this is going on, and whilst Stella's pushing flying the flag for climate change, meanwhile over in Britain, away from Abu Dhabi. Um, this year, um, Paul McCartney got into a bit of a um a spot of bother with the campaign group Fossil Free London for doing the opposite. Yeah. Um, certainly a book I haven't read this year and I've got no intention of reading is a, a new book of photographs he's released. It's called 1964 Eyes of the Storm, and basically it's a photograph book, um, private photos he said he took in 1964 if you believe that is the actual same person um, right. taking photographs, basically um, private photographs that Paul took back in 1964 when the Beatles were on tour, you know, informal photographs of them chilling out on stage, talking to friends, this kind of thing. I, I don't know. I, I, that's the basic gist of it. I think, I, I, as I say, I, I've got no interest in reading it. I don't know. 
But um, to coincide with this, he he um, he had a um, exhibition of the photographs of some of the photographs at the National Portrait Gallery in London. Um, and this was between June and October. And on one of those days, um, it was gate crashed by Fossil Free London campaign group, mm. who, according to its website, is a grassroots climate action group that aims to kick fossil fuel companies and their financiers out of the UK's capital. So that would be London, of course. Now, the reason they gate crashed that exhibition was because the gallery is reported is uh, sponsored by the Bank of America, who reportedly, according to one report I've read, are ranked as the fourth largest global banking investor in fossil fuels in a 2022 report, having provided $232 billion between 2016 and 2021 to fossil fuel companies and projects. However, the bank and its peers are coming under increased scrutiny and pressure to divest such interests in order to meet climate goals. Now, apparently what happens, you can find this, you can, there's, there's video footage of fossil free London going to this exhibition, gate crashing it. Uh, and I've seen it and listened to it. Basically from what I can tell, there was a, what they did was they stood in front of one of the photographs, these protesters, and there was about 20 of them. I counted about 20 of them and they're standing there with a large banner um, that reads bank of America funds climate chaos. Um, and whilst they're standing there, they're singing Beatles songs, but with the lyrics changed yeah. to suit the agenda. <laughs> Um, one of the songs goes, help, the planet's burning, help, the seas are rising, <laughs> help, because of oily money, help. Um, oh, my God. It's, oh, God, it's like stick your finger down your throat time, really. Um, <laughs> there's, there's another one. They just look like a bunch of old, oh, hello, Tarquin, oh, <laughs> jolly holly sticks. That's the, oh, God. Um, there was oh, another one. It was called Planet B, and it was changed the lyrics to Let It Be. Um, and I didn't go as far as as far as to write down the lyrics of this. I just gave up <laughs> listening to it. Something like Planet B, Planet B, Planet B, Planet B. We don't have any other planets. We've only got this one, Planet B, or something <clears throat> like that. Um, wow! Uh, and then they later took their protest outside of the gallery, and, and yeah, we've just been protesting inside this building, inside the National Portrait Gallery, because they have an exhibition of Paul McCartney's photos that is sponsored by the Bank of America. Bank of America are the fourth largest funder of fossil fuels in the world. Their money is driving climate breakdown. Frankly, we should not be allowing these institutions, these corporations that are fueling climate collapse to be sponsoring our cultural institutions. We should not allow them to slap their logo on top of the art that we all cherish so that they can get some good PR. So shame on the National, National Portrait Gallery for accepting Bank of America's oily money. So let's say, oily money out. There is no planet B, so we must make this one fossil free. Planet B, planet B, there is no I think what the protesters were there to do was to use Paul McCartney to highlight the fact that the National Portrait Gallery as a body, as, as a complete entity, is paid for in some way, shape or form by Bank of America. Got yeah. It. So, yeah, it's a bit of they, a PR disaster in a way. Bit of a, Yeah. Yeah. Used his popularity to get the point across. Yeah. Um, yeah. You could maybe say that he, he should have done some. It's a bit of a hiccup for him because he's we've we've talked about this in previous episodes that he he likes to wave the climate change agenda flag. McCartney does. Paul McCartney does. Right. Um, and and his yeah, family. It, it makes him look hypocritical. Um, maybe one might suggest he should have done his homework before he, right. he went and, and did this, because there he is preaching to the rest of us, the great unwashed again, you know, that we should be taking note of climate change. And there he is you know, staging this event in this place where, I don't know. I mean, I, I remember in a past episode, we talked about when his Egypt station, uh, you know, the, the Egypt station album is 2018 album. When that came out, there was a track on it 
um, which is called Despite Repeated Warnings. And I think we talked about the lyrics of that song. I mentioned it in a previous episode um, Mm -hmm. because apparently that is a climate change agenda song that he wrote. Um, To quote him, this is what he said about the song. He said, there was a president named Trump who thought that climate change was a hoax. A braggart has been in charge and seems quite unstable, to say the least. He's shouting the loudest, but he's not necessarily the smartest. And if you look at the impact someone like Greta Thunberg has had, it's inspirational. The climate Mm. crisis is rightly a huge concern amongst her generation. Um, So, yeah, so he's doing he's saying all that. And then, yeah, you could maybe some people would say he's been a bit hypocritical. But um, yeah, yeah. also this year it was announced that Yoko's leaving the Dakota. Um, Right. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you turned my attention to this story. Um, it was reported earlier this in 2023. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, when I heard she she has left, she moved out of it, but and then there was rumors that she it was for sale, but now it's not apparently. It's not. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Appa- apparently, she moved out during the lockdowns. I've got a report here in front of me, and I'm just skimming through it. It's from the Mail Online again. Um, Because apparently Mm -hmm. the Mail Online claims that they've got the exclusive on this story that came out in February of 2023. And I'm just skimming through it. And apparently, um, yeah, she decided uh, she actually moved out um, during the lockdowns. But she's now decided since then that that's it. She's not going to return. So so she announced that in the 50th year of having moved in there with John Lennon. They moved in in 1973. And it does... It does go on to mention her ill health. I think we mentioned it in a previous episode. Um, yeah. Yeah. It says here, um, she was once the toast of New York City, but has been forced to step back from public life as a result of her ill health in recent years. It's been reported that she requires round the clock medical care. And at an event in 2017, which she attended in a wheelchair, she remarked from the stage, I have learned so much from having this illness. Uh, but I don't know what what the illness is or was. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it's been revealed. No. Um, some people have suggested cancer, but yeah, no one actually knows for sure. Well, the people close to her will know, but we we certainly don't. Right. Um, so that got me thinking about the Dakota itself, this place that they that she and John lived at for all those years. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and it's an interesting building to say the least. Um, I don't know what you know about the Dakota itself. There's certainly stories of hauntings for a start. Um, yeah, it's one of the most haunted, famously haunted buildings in America, in North America. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. I've got. Um, I, I just learned um, just the other day. Um, I was looking up some stuff about the Dakota for this, and it has its own mortuary. Did what? you know that? In the basement, apparently, of the Dakota, there's a room that was built specifically because um, the man who built it, whose name is escaping me at the moment, or the architect. Yeah, Edward Clark. There you go. Yeah, it was built Um, in the 1800s, yeah, by Edward Clark. Right, in the 1800s, 1883, I think it was commissioned, if I remember right, and built a specific room for um, residents who would have passed away in their apartment could be taken down to this room and would never have to leave the Dakota until it was time for their funeral. And there's oh. a mortuary door on the back side of the building that um, is, it goes right to only to that mortuary, you know, only to that little space that was commissioned for that. And there's a door that leads out to the back area of the Dakota so that they can leave in, in privacy and, the hearse can come and pull right up next to it and take the body away. But John was there. Never- I never knew that. Yeah. No. I all of these years I never knew that. That was very very strange to learn. Was John Lennon's body ever taken there at any point? I don't know because I don't think so because the remember the police came right after he was shot and the police car actually took him to the hospital. Yeah. So I don't think he ever saw the inside of that that room. But but who knows. Maybe yeah, they did. All kinds of weird stuff happened that night. So yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> I've looked into this. I, I actually bought a book. Um, it's called Life at the Dakota: New York's Most Unusual Address. 
It's by Stephen Birmingham. Um, mm. Yeah, it was it was built in the 1880s. And at the time it was built, New York was still a young place at the time. And it was virtually deserted. If you look mm-hmm. at pictures from the 1800s, when it was there first there, there was actually pretty much nothing around it. It was like prairie land almost. I mean, right. this is like early days of 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 the Dakota. Um, apparently when John and Yoko moved in in 1973, they moved into an apartment. The person that had been in it before was an actor, an Oscar winning actor, Hollywood actor who's called Robert Ryan. Mm-hmm. Um I'd never heard of him. Um, when I when I read the name, I thought, Robert Ryan, who's Robert Ryan? And then I looked at a picture of him, a photograph, and oh, okay. He died in nineteen seven uh, he died in July of seventy-three, and and John and Yoko moved in a little bit after that. Um he lived there with his wife. Um um yeah, I saw a picture of him. Um it would have been before my time, obviously. I wouldn't have what I would have been three, four years old when this guy when he passed away. Mm-hmm. So I wouldn't have known about his career. Um, personally so uh, when he was alive so I but yeah I looked at pictures of him and go oh yeah I've seen him in films before yeah yeah um mm-hmm. so apparently what they did when they moved in knowing that Robert had been there um he might have actually died there um it's claimed he did he did it's claimed I believe he died in in that apartment yeah he d- actually did so that would explain then why it's claimed that John and Yoko held a seance to summon yeah. him up yeah According like, to... but like right, right away, like before all their stuff was moved in, I believe. Oh, they really? For you know, one of the very first things they did when they when they um uh, bought the the apartment. And ac- according to this book, um, I won't read the extract from it. I'll just sort of scan through it and and say it as I see it. Basically, um, they held this seance um, and they summoned up um Robert's wife who died of cancer. Uh, apparently she died in the Dakota as well. And she told John and Yoko after she'd summoned them up. Um, yeah, they did this via a medium. It wasn't John and Yoko doing this. They got a medium to come in and do it for them. Um, and, and apparently um, Robert Ryan's wife um, was summoned up and she said that she, was, she, she wasn't going to leave the apartment. She was going to stay there, but she was cool with them getting on with their lives there and living there and she wouldn't bother them apparently right um and yoko then telephoned the daughter of uh the of robert and uh jesse ryan she they telephoned uh, yoko telephoned the, the daughter and told her what her mother had said to her in the seance and apparently the daughter said oh if my mother's ghost belongs anywhere it should be with me not with you um <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's according to yeah this book that i read um which is called life at the dakota new york's most unusual address um also in that book there's uh, you, you talk about the basement um actually i'll get on to that in a minute apparently a, another story of a haunting and again this is from the book the same book uh not long ago a resident by the name of frederick weinstein had a most curious experience. Uh, He was walking home to the Dakota and before crossing the street, paused to look up, as apartment dwellers often do, at the windows of his apartment, which faces both 72nd Street and Central Park. He was startled to see through the windows of his living room an enormous crystal chandelier suspended from the ceiling, ablaze with light. He checked the windows again, counted the floors. It was obviously his apartment. No other Mm. apartment occupies that particular third floor corner. And yet he knew that his apartment contained no crystal chandelier, nor had it as long as he had lived there. Of course, when he got upstairs, the crystal chandelier had gone. But there was, as there had been from the time the Weinsteins had taken the apartment, a round nipple protruding from the centre of the living room ceiling, from which, Mm. once upon a time, a chandelier of some sort had clearly hung. Um, wow. yeah. And again, from the same book from Stephen Birmingham, um, there's a, a Mrs. Vesley, Elise Vesley, who lived at the Dakota or at least, I don't know, actually, I don't know if she actually lived at the Dakota. She was the lady managerette. Managerette. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, and sm- she, the smiling lady. Yes. I was going to get mm-hmm. to that. That's who John calls the smiling lady, the ghost of the, the crying lady. Sorry. Yeah. John referred mm. to as the crying lady, apparently. Crying lady. Um, apparently she'd undergone a deep personal tragedy, according to Stephen Birmingham's book. A handsome young son, the apple of her eye, one day had been struck down by a truck 
on 72nd Street, just in front of the Dakota and killed. Uh, she never quite got over that. Um, she believed in psychokinesis and claimed that with the power of her mind, she could move large objects. Uh, and yeah, as you say, John Lennon saw um, quote unquote paranormal sightings. Um, he, he, he saw like a, a phantom. He described seeing a phantom walking up and down the corridors, down the hallways. And he, he referred to her as the crying lady. Um, mm -hmm. And it's thought that it could be Elise Vesley. Yeah. And with regards to the basement, as I say, I've got um, another extract from that book, and this is to do with the basement and hauntings there, apparently. Um, to quote from the book, there have been other odd happenings within the building that are harder to explain. Joe Milziner, for example, was one man who was particularly devoted to the Dakota, and he kept scrapbooks of bits and pieces of Dakota history. He often said he suspected that there were spirits in the place. He died in 1976 outside the Dakota's door in a taxi on his way home from a visit with his doctor. How many people have died outside the Dakota? John Lennon, right. um, Vesley's son, and this um, individual here. Um, so, yeah, so f for several weeks after his death, queer things went on in the building's cavernous basement. Uh, tenant Wilbur Ross, a banker was summoned suddenly to the basement by a frightened porter who reported that a heavy snow shovel, which had been hanging properly against the wall, had all at once flung itself 20 feet across the room and landed in the middle of the floor. Later, neatly stacked plastic bags of garbage that had been waiting to go out by the service door similarly flew into the centre of the room and landed in the middle of the floor. Mr Ross himself, an American representative of the House of Rothschild, insists mm. uh oh and a man uh, who who one would not expect to be impressed by spiritual spiritualist phenomena insists he saw a heavy metal bar make the same uncanny journey through the air and land a short distance from his feet when he tried to lift the bar it was too heavy for him uh, during this same period one of the four ancient service elevators manually operated affairs requiring cables and pulleys suddenly began to rise from the basement level of its own accord it took four strong men wrestling at the cables to bring it down again in time these manifestations ceased but it was widely assumed that they had something to do with Joe Milziner's impatience with his new whereabouts. Um, hmm. And I didn't know about the bodies and the mortuary. This is the basement. I'm just wondering whether this is in the same vicinity, because now we're hearing like hauntings. You know, here we have these hauntings and finding out, yeah. like you said to me about the, yeah, weird. Um, could very well be. Could very well be. And this Wilbur Ross this so-called American representative of the House of Rothschild. I did a bit of digging and yeah, apparently from what I understand, um, yeah, from the late 1970s, from 1976, this Wilbur Ross spent over two decades working at NM Rothschild, an investment bank company. Uh, he was in charge of their bankruptcy restructuring and advisory arm. He was also privatization advisor to Rudy Giuliani when he was mayor of mm. New York and he served under president Trump as secretary of commerce between 2017 and 2021. And he's also featured, he's listed on the world economic forums website as one of its so-called people. Um, and he's attended their public events and spoken at them as well. Yeah. Someone else who lived at the Dakota who, with a questionable, um, you might say background is a guy by the name of CD Jackson, Charles Douglas Jackson. He was involved in psychological warfare activities for the U.S. during World mm. War II. He was de uh, he was deputy chief of the psychological warfare division. And then after the war, um, he wrote speeches, foreign policy speeches for the government, for the U.S. government. Um, he was a special assistant to then President Eisenhower, U.S. President Eisenhower. And he liaised with the CIA and the National Security Council. Um, he was also he was also managing director of Time Life international which is time and life magazine isn't it oh, um yeah and apparently he's responsible for buying the rights to the zapruder film um oh wow of course abraham zapruder was the guy who filmed um john f kennedy being shot as he was right. in the motorcade uh this businessman who had his own private home cine camera and he just happened to take this footage and apparently yet yeah, uh, C.D. Jackson, with uh, in his role as head honcho of Time Life International, he approached the day after the, the shooting, he approached Zapruder 
and and bought the rights to the footage oh. and suppressed it for over a decade. So wow. the reference being, of course, the accusation being is that he did this deliberately in order to hide, to keep the official narrative of JFK's shooting on on the right track, as it were. Um, right. Yeah. So that's so basically that's why he bought the rights to it, it was just to to keep any explanation of a an you know of an alternative narrative away you know from from coming out um someone else yeah. who lived at um at the dakota it's reported um was none other than john frankenheimer who is the director of the film the manchurian candidate <laughs> um so you got all these links again to assassination and mind control here we go again right um, and big banking families that's yoko too Oh yeah, of course, cool. and royalty, yeah, and yeah. yeah. Um, I d- I put up a video about two or three years ago, and it was um a video linking Charles Manson to the Beatles and Roman Polanski and the film Rosemary's Baby, and mm-hmm. and all these various weird, spooky connections. Some of them very real and factual. Some of them a bit occult, esoteric, and maybe not so true, but very spooky. Um, mm-hmm. and and. Yeah, I put up a video and uh, about it, and and there's there's a section when the Beatles first went to America in 1964. Um, they well, uh, two years before that, there was the movie the Manchurian Candidate. I think came out in 1962. I think it came out, and there's a scene in the film where you actually see the protagonist, the Manchurian Candidate. There's a scene in the film where he's standing by a river. I think it is, and if you look in the background. You can actually see in the background one of the buildings is the Dakota. So mm. here we have a Manchurian candidate standing, and behind him you can see the Dakota. Fast forward to 1964 when the Beatles went to America uh, for the first time um, as part of the so called British invasion. They did a photo shoot in New York, and I don't think George went to that photo shoot. I think he had tonsillitis. So it was just Paul, John, Ringo I think um and they stood they they went and they did a photo shoot for the press uh, an outside photo shoot and if you look they're standing in exactly the same spot where the Manchurian candidate was standing at in the film mm-hmm. because if you look in the background behind the Beatles you can see the Dakota and it's um right. so here you have the Beatles standing just yeah in the background the very right. place where john would be shot what 16 years later um yeah. yeah eerie yeah and of course you know i think we've spoken about it before we've got the links to rosemary's baby the film mm-hmm. from 1968 and the dakota um because right. it was um, it was the, the 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 Dakota was used by Roman Polanski, the director, in 1968 as the exterior shots of what was in the film, the fictional Branford apartment building. Um, right. And, and this is where Rosemary, played by Mia Farrow, and her husband in the film moved into and became friends with this elderly couple who it turns out were Satan worshippers. Um and I think I might have mentioned this before. I'm not sure. But um, aside from that link, you, you know, aside from the Dakota being used by Roman Polanski, of course, his wife was Sharon Tate. There's a scene in the film where you see a commotion going on outside the Dakota. And what's happened is, is somebody has fallen out of the window a young girl a young lady has fallen out of the window and we don't know if she was pushed whether it was a uh, suicide or whether it was an accident we don't we don't actually learn that in the film but all we know is that she's fallen out of this window and she's landed outside the dakota so again <laughs> somebody dying outside the dakota okay it's fictional right. but so and as we get and closer, she, she landed on a, a white volkswagen be- beetle exactly so yeah. the spot <laughs> where john lennon was shot where he met his death here we have um you know um 12 years before that happened we have a white volkswagen Mm -hmm. beetle covered in blood a beetle in white um and if you look a year later from 1968 to august 69 
we have a Beatle in white again, because if you look at the cover of the Abbey Road album cover, you've got the Beatles walking across that crossing, zebra crossing. You've got mm-hmm. John at the front walking in front of the other three members, and he's all in white. So we have a Beatle in white. And if you mm-hmm. look in the background, of course, you've got the infamous white Volkswagen Beetle parked up on the curb. So again, a Beetle, a white Beetle, a white right. Volkswagen Beetle. And then if you look back to 68, you've got the white Volkswagen Beetle, of course, in Rosemary's Baby covered in blood. Um, and and the, the Abbey Road cover, that picture was taken, I believe it was August 8th, 1969, the same day as the Man- Charles Manson murders. Yeah. That yeah. picture was taken on the same day that Sharon Tate was killed. Yeah. 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 Very strange. Really strange. And there's just so many of those weird connections. And I've looked into it um in in a in a video that I put up on my YouTube page and I've written about it in an article as well. Um so yeah, really weird. Apparently, uh, I was looking at the novel of because Rosemary's Baby is based on a novel. Um, and in the novel, I, I had a quick skim through it. And apparently in the novel version of Rosemary's Baby, the Dakota is actually mentioned um, as an option to move into. So Mm. before they move into the Branford, the fictional Branford in the novel, um, I think Rosemary and her husband actually discuss whether they should move into the Dakota. Mm. Um, So, yeah, so I wasn't aware of that until I read about it a few weeks ago. And just to tie this up, Yoko Ono, it's claimed, has seen John Lennon's ghost in the Dakota as well. Um, I've got a report here from the newspaper, the Sunday Mirror, from May 1983. And the headline reads, John Lennon's ghost visits Yoko Ono. Uh, John Lennon's ghost is said to be haunting the New York apartment where the ex-Beatle was murdered. Several people claim to have seen his ghostly figure wearing familiar round glasses. Friends of his wife, Yoko Ono, say that John's spirit has spoken to her. Um, Musician Joey Harrow who lives nearby, is convinced that he saw John's ghost at the entrance to the Dakota building at the spot where he was shot three years ago. And and quoting him here, he says, he was surrounded by an eerie light. Amanda Moores, a writer who was with Joey at the time, says she also saw Lennon's ghost. I wanted to go up and talk to him, but something in the way he looked at me said, no. Yoko, who still lives in the same block with their son, Sean, claims to have seen John sitting at at his uh, white piano and that on one occasion he said to her don't be afraid i am still with you um Mm -hmm. yeah and there's a couple of other reports here that i haven't been able to confirm these are kind of like secondhand reports apparently there's a psychic by the name of sean robbins um spelt s-h-a-w-n and she claims that she's seen john's ghost in the building as well but that's that that that, yeah i I haven't been able to really confirm that as such because it's kind of like secondhand information yes i haven't actually found her saying that herself but um yeah well, well okay we're coming up to the end now and i thought this might be a good spot to mention um the passing of denny lane um mm. yeah so, so, just uh, saw him uh play a live performance just a few months ago it wasn't even that long ago he and a couple other collaborators played um the Beatles revolver album front to back and yeah and it was just you know it sounds strange when you when you hear of some I just saw him yesterday you know it was like I just saw (laughs) I had no idea that he was sick or anything you know was going on it was kind of a surprise to me to hear that he passed but yeah I'm sure he took lots of stories with him to the grave as well oh yeah uh, for yeah. anyone who doesn't know yeah. quickly, he was like the permanent member of Paul McCartney's 70s band Wings. I mean, uh, it, it was formed in 1971. They kind of split very quietly in 1981, I think. Um, but he yeah. was the constant member along with Paul and Linda McCartney, Paul's wife, then wife, uh, because there was a lot of band member comings and goings in that that band, wasn't there? I mean, it was constantly changing lineups. Um, a drummer would come he'd leave another one would come in a guitarist would come would leave come in bass player etc etc but the one constant member apart from Paul and Linda was was Denny who was with them from the beginning until the end Um, I've got an official statement here from his wife on a on Denny Lane's official Facebook page Um, she says my darling husband passed away 
um, peacefully early this morning. Um, this is on the day um, he passed away. She posted this. I was at his bedside um, holding his hand as I played his favourite Christmas songs for him. He's been singing Christmas songs the past few weeks. Um, and I continue to play Christmas songs while he's been in ICU on a ventilator this past week. Um, he and I yeah. both believed he would overcome his health setbacks and return to the rehabilitation center and eventually home. Unfortunately, his lung disease, which is, and I, I, I apologize if I pronounce this wrong, his lung disease, interstitial yeah. lung disease, ILD, uh, is unpredictable and aggressive. Each infection weakened and damaged his lungs. Uh, he fought every day. Um, all he wanted was to be home with me playing his gypsy guitar um again just as, as it always is in the beatles world you have these what some people might deem to be coincidence um right. but others wouldn't um they deem it to be something more strong stronger than that and and you get this in the world of quote unquote celebrity you get when when celebrities die and, and you suspect that something amiss something suspicious might have happened or even when you don't there's all these kind of weird synchronicities that are attached to that person's that celebrity's death apparently there's a new repackaged re-release of the wings album uh, from 1973 band on the run um which danny was on of course that's coming out next year it's coming out in february mm -hmm. it's coming out on february the 2nd 2024 um now the re-release of this band on the run which is coming out next year was was announced on december 4th 2023 and the next day December 5th is when Denny Lane died. Hmm. Um, add to that, Band on the Run, when it was originally released, was released 50 years earlier in 1973. To the day, exactly 50 years earlier, Band on the Run was released on December 5th, 1973. Yeah, 50, yeah so weird, 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 weird. Um, yeah. 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 Um, and you talk about secrets. Have you ever heard that um, interview that he did with somebody called Outlaw Renegade Nation? It's on YouTube. Um, about Paul is dead. Yeah. Basically, <laughs> this this interviewer asks him, and you can find this online. I think it. I think the actual title of it online is Denny Lane interview with Outlaw Renegade Nation. The whole interview is about twenty minutes or something like that. But you can find an edited version where. It's just this piece about Paul is dead. And basically what this interviewer asks De Denny is, and this was this was filmed about four years ago or so. What was it like playing with Billy Shepard instead of Paul McCartney? And Denny yeah. says, who's Billy Shepard? Billy Shears. <laughs> and he and the interviewer says, ah, Billy Shears Campbell. That's all you had to say, my friend. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. OK, right. I'm going to wrap this up. Um, and I thought we'd wrap it up with something quite humorous. Um, I don't know if I sent you this link. In the last episode of of, of Magical Mystery Talk, we talked briefly about um, Rolling Stone magazine, the online version of it, this so-called Bible of mainstream rock music, this mainstream rock magazine. There was an mm -hmm. article about Beatles conspiracy theories. We talked about it in the last episode and, and how Rolling Stone tried to tag people who are into cons Beatles conspiracy theories, um, tried to label them as being um wacko QAnon um nutters basically right. freak freaks basically um well um, I think that's how we closed the last episode and I'm going to close this episode with some more mainstream reporting on Beatles conspiracy theories and this time it's centered around Ringo because there was an article I don't know if I sent you the link to this there's an article and it's on a website called vulture.com and it's with Ringo. It's an article with Ringo. And they ask him a, a number of questions. And one of the questions was under the title Ringo Conspiracy Theories. So it's not even a question. It's just a title. And he answers. He answers. He, he gives his answer to the title. And this is what he said. He said, we only ever had one conspiracy that stuck. That was Paul is dead. And there were some songs people pointed out as being quote unquote secret john by accident learned how to play a tape backwards and we put that to full use 
So we'd just do something silly at the end of a track and it'd be all over the newspapers and on the radio. Hey, they're actually singing blah, 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 blah. It just made us all laugh. All of those interesting things we said were not that interesting. We had a great laugh about that, though. Look at what they're saying now. <laughs> I do sometimes get the feeling that they, they listen to us and they know what we do. I'm not, I'm not trying to blow our, you know, you know, trumpet. No, blow, you know blow, what? the trumpet or anything but i just get the impression sometimes that they know you know and they listen and they watch and they look and they read i i honestly believe that because you know if maybe if they don't personally they have somebody who does you know who just keeps up on on all of the things and just merely for security in a way you know because if you have somebody who you know has some kind of vendetta or something against them, you know, like they, they've had death threats and they've had John Lennon actually murdered and, you know, all of those, those things. And so it would be, it would be a good security um, investment to, to keep up on people who might be, you know, saying bad things or whatever. Not that we're saying bad things, no. but just, you know. Yeah. I, I, if I had all the money in the world and all the people who wanted to, you know, work for me and all that, I mean, why not keep yeah. up on it? If if for nothing else, for a laugh. I'm a nobody, but I'm I'm worried sometimes about things that I would write yeah. about. You know, just I, yeah, I don't want to make anybody mad or suspicious or, you know, anything yeah. like that. So yeah, yeah, I'm, same here. To be I'd honest. be careful and respectful. Also, I did it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, lock the doors lock the right. windows well, I, yeah yeah and um just to go back to that that new book that's coming out um you know if if it's true that there was a second shooter shooting from the front guess who saw that who was in front yeah. of john lennon yeah yoko she would have seen everything right yeah and that's one of the questions yeah. i want to ask david whelan if we do get him back for a magical mystery talk interview if you like i would like to ask him so where was yoko and all this was going on right yeah and she claims like she she didn't know where she you know where she was or what was it was so chaotic that she didn't register what was happening or or whatever but you know i mean come on and and not only you that you saw something you saw something yeah exactly the, the i think they this thing and mm, yeah I think David did actually say to me when I, in the interview, or I've heard him say in other interviews that she's Yoko Ono's never said the same thing twice or three times. Right. She keeps change every time she's talked about that night. It's, it's a different story. Um, and the other thing that bothers me slightly is if she did see a second shooter, which she would have done if she was where she says she was, I would right. guess. Um, why does she keep every time that Mark Chapman comes up for parole? Why does she personally make sure that he doesn't come out on parole? Because I've I've read reports that she's actually personally um, recommended that he not be released. Right. Oh so, yeah, every parole yeah. hearing. So if she thinks he's not the shooter, why does she stop him from coming out? Well, I, if, yeah. Again, I don't. I don't want to speculate or. Yeah. Make anybody hate me, but there could be some collaboration in there, you know? Yeah. Well, you so. wouldn't be the first person. So you're, you're all right. You're, you're, you're um, safe in numbers. Cause, um, right. oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but still, there, that, it's an odd situation and all of the weird coincidences that go around with it as well. It's just, you know. And, and and something we forgot to mention in that that two parter that we did on John's death back in 2020, I think I did mention it to you at the time, and and I, uh, but we weren't sure what the source was. I've since discovered what the source was. I just couldn't re I couldn't remember it at the time. Um, I mentioned at the time that um, they were meant to have a bodyguard on that night. They normally usually had a bodyguard. John and Yoko usually had a bodyguard, and on that night, he was called off. Not not yes. he, did, he wasn't on duty and I couldn't right. remember where I, I I heard that and it was only after we mentioned that on Magical Mystery Talk someone sent me an email and said 
um, I heard you mention this, that, and the other. And apparently the person who said it was, um, who was that BBC radio DJ that interviewed John and Yoko? His name has completely got Andy Peebles. Uh, oh, okay. It was Andy Peebles in an article, again, the Mail Online, go figure, who right. claims that um, <clears throat> he, he kept in touch with Yoko after after the killing. I, I think he, he was on personal terms with her, not super personal terms, not personal personal, but he stayed in touch with her over the years. And I think it was him who, yeah, it was Andy Peebles who says that he there was meant to have been a bodyguard that night, um, right. that day. And he was called off. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. And oddly, and I, I think also um, uh, Fred Seaman in his book, Dakota Days, said something similar too, because he was also caught off. Fred Seaman was um, John Lennon's personal driver yeah. and, um, you know, a personal assistant and whatnot. And he was and like, he was also called off that day. Yeah. Unexpectedly. So when he was supposed to be working. So, yeah. All yeah. kinds of strange stuff. And 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 Seaman was like the Mal. He was like the Mal Evans for John. Right. And so, he looked a lot like John. He, he was did. mistaken for John yeah, a couple of did. times out in public. Yeah. So you, yeah. There's footage of him in, in interviews. I think I saw a video of him a few weeks back, a week or so back as we're recording this, where he's being interviewed by Joan Rivers, um, of all people, and May Pang is on the sitting with him. God, he really looks like John Lennon. He looks like yeah. 1980 era John Lennon, you know. Right. So you you could say he could pass it pass off as a a decoy at a some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, double. Sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, yep, absolutely. And he he's gotten lots of flack from Yoko. He tries to you know he released that court. book and yeah, she took him to court and he's like not allowed to speak about anything at all during his employment there. And yeah, he's been told to cease and What's that cease and desist? Yeah. Um, yeah, he's yeah. Yoko does not like him very much at all. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Anyway. Anyway. Anyway, anyway. We'll wrap this up. Good show, number nine. <laughs> yeah. Number nine. Number nine. Number nine. Number nine. Number nine. Yeah, number nine. <laughs>